So why are you guys Lions fans? Or how is you? How are you guys Lions fans? Okay, so Griff and I are the only two Lions fans in the house. So I was a Lions fan because when I was we lived in Albany, New York, and my we every Thanksgiving we would go to whatever my grandparents' brother's house or whatever. It's in Utica, and it was very old school back then where. Like the men were in one room watching football and they're smoking whatever cigar just smelled like smoke in there. And the women are all in the kitchen and then you had a room for like the kids area, which is off the dining room mm-hmm. where the kids are. So one time I got in there and I'm like, and they're like, you got to go back to the kids room. And I was like, I'm watching Billy Sims. And they go, you know who Billy Sims is? And I go, yeah. They're like, so you're a Lions fan? And I'm like, yeah, you can stay. So from then on out, I got to stay with the adult room. And I remember one of my brothers like, dude, I want to get it. And they're like, no. Do you know anything about it? No. Get back in the kids room. So it was like, boom, it was my way out. It was my way into like adulthood of sitting in there with all the, gr- with all the grown up guys. That's so awesome. I was a Lions fan just by that. And then over, over the years, I learned to hate the Bears and the Packers because they lose those guys. Yeah. I remember an overtime game they went to and lost on the opening kickoff. I think it was, the, it was either the Bears or Green Bay. I think it was the Bears. Just pissed me off. And I'm like, I respect like the 85 Bears, stuff like that, but I, they were a great team. Yeah. And we were good for forever. But you learn to just like just hate the Packers. Like just absolutely, like other than like Sterling Sharp and that's yeah Sterling, yeah, Sterling. and uh, and maybe James Lofton. I'm like the rest of them. I don't care. I, yeah. Those two guys were cool. The rest of the guys suck. So all my friends are Lions fans, or most of them. And but like, you got to be cautiously optimistic. It's they. So I would love Aaron Rodgers as a Chiefs fan. I was like, oh man, Aaron Rodgers, he's so good. So if if the Chiefs could oh ever just get a guy like Aaron Rodgers, and now. Like, I can't stand Aaron Rodgers, but for the most part, like, I never understood the hatred towards the Packers and towards Aaron Rodgers. I'm like, dude, he's so good. And then all my friends would be like, man, he's the biggest whiner. He's the complainer. He always gets the calls. And I'm like, yeah, I see it now. It's not so much It's not so much the whining for the calls. I get it. Every great quarterback at times has issues with that. Like, mm-hmm. whatever. But – it's the I don't see like for the first few games after he got hurt he was nowhere around like he was in California yeah like he's not about the team he shows up when he can throw footballs before the game it's about him it's about he could him have done that he could I have done that. that anywhere I agree it's with that it's always about him I agree just like with that. he goes on there and says stuff on on his show or on Pac McAfee show he has this yeah. spot like to say stuff but as soon as some of the guys start talking about stuff he goes there's no no, that's not okay for other players. Like, he's just aloof and, and just to himself. Just like, do you really think there's not going to be the same contract issues? That, there just will. He's going to have this, I might play, I might this, because he has, he has to stay in the media. He can't be it's, lost, That's what it is. He can't be hurting out of it for the whole year. 100%. No. And then, like, he could just also say something positive about, about uh, what's his name, the quarterback now. Zach, because yeah. I, yeah. I feel bad for him because everything he does well, they go, well, that's because Aaron Rodgers showed him out. Like, anything yeah, exactly. he doesn't do well – it's all on Zach. Yep. And I'm like, okay, but the line isn't great. And I'm no. like, there's a good chance Aaron would have gotten hurt either anyway, way. In, anyway, yeah, yes. Down the road. A hundred percent. And, I, and I, I wonder if they're, are they really that talented? Brees Hall is, is awesome. Their defense and, is good. And Wilson is very good. But other than that, there's no offensive threat. Like, who's their second wide receiver? Alan Lazard? I mean... McCole Hardman from which, the Chiefs which, again, has those are, one catch, those two are, catches. Those maybe. are his guys, just like when he was Green Bay. All of oh, a sudden yeah. he was happy when he could have more of a say. Cop. He gets his guys in, and then it's, well, he doesn't have enough weapons they gave him. But, I'm sorry. It, he, these are the guys he wants. He has to take some blame, just like LeBron. He wants these guys in. He yeah. gets the blame. Like, dude, you wanted these guys. Throw me with talent. These are the guys you wanted. And, oh, well, blah, blah, blah. He doesn't have a talent in defense. Dude. You lost in the playoffs twice where you couldn't score a touchdown. Your defense held them. They held the Niners the one year for nothing. The special teams gave up one touchdown, and you, the MVP, couldn't at home score one touchdown. Yeah. I'm like, are you really that much better than the guy in San Diego? Like, are you, or are you just like fancy and everything else, and they just have anointed you? Yeah. You got your one Super Bowl early, yep. and then Never I'm like, been bad. no, I was like, at least Marino really had not a lot around him. Like, he had a couple of dwarf receivers that were good at, like, yeah. getting open. But, I'm like, he was a phenomenal, phenomenal, I thought. And I didn't like Marino. I didn't like him growing up. Right. But I'm like, he was great. He was just great. And, but, ball, and, and, and I'm not saying Rodgers isn't a good quarterback. I just feel like the drama and everything else that goes around with it, I'm just like, maybe he's not the guy to lead your team. That's all. I, yeah. 
I agree with that 100%. I think there's just certain things about it. Like, whether you like them or not, like the other elite quarterbacks, I'm like, guys play hard for Brady. They play for Josh Allen. They play for Mahomes. Like, I don't see them like, yeah, you're going to have one wide receiver getting pissed off once in a while and get the ball enough, but you don't see the guys not playing. Or you see them like, they're they're a part of like what they're, they seem to be a part of that. And I don't see that with him. I yeah. see what, anything he does is more about him, always. Oh, yeah. So, but and I mean, he, and he's a, it, was a Packer, so I didn't like him. And I don't like the Jets either, but so it kind of fit. They should have just shipped him to Dallas because then the whole drama, the, all the ESPN <laughs> fit, could just like fit in all there. the, but they could just, ESPN would just be Dallas because that's all it is. Even 100%. This, morning, this morning was Dallas first and then, then uh, Aaron Rodgers. Yep. And I'm like, that's your Wednesday show. I was like, oh. yeah, because it's like, why are both of them in? They have to. Why are the Lions clicks. getting, why aren't the Lions getting the publicity of the Cowboys? They got a little bit this morning. They're on owner, good morning, America. They got a little, or not. Whatever, good morning, a good morning football. football. They got a little bit today. They got a little, and I'm almost like, don't go overboard on them either. But I like the fact their coaches like last. I thought for I sure the Panthers game was going to be their downfall. I was like, this is the game that they just that have too. a letdown and it stays close and something happens. Yeah. Just like I thought said that with the Bills. I go, this is one of those games. The Giants. I go, I wouldn't be surprised if the Giants win. It's going to be close, and the Bills fall into that all the time. But yeah. I was like with the Lions. I was like, it's, but then I heard the coach. Uh, just before the like a day before the game, whenever talking to the media, he's like, "No, they're they're us. We they're the same. Like we've been there, and, and it wasn't long ago. They are us. We understand what that's like in that locker room. Yeah. He's like, we don't feel like we're ahead. Of, like we have to work at everything we do. And I was yeah. like, he's so centered. I like that. And again, he's a guy that the guys want to play for. Which I thought initially, I was like, yeah, they'll play hard for him. But is he just a dumb like let's yeah, go, let's go like meathead or but whatever? But he seems. Yeah. He seems like legit. Like I really, really like him. I like him too. I um, like him a lot. And I don't think they're the most talented team in the league. I think their offense and defensive lines, though, are going to put them in a position Aiden that Hutchinson they is yes. just a wrecker. I know. But and I said that last year about the Eagles had one of the best offense and defensive lines, and that's where their success came. Yep. I don't know about all the fancy and the yeah, either pick up this guy or that guy. I'm like their lines are good. Mm-hmm. I'm like if your lines aren't good, you're limited. Yep. You're very limited. It's all about protecting the quarterback and getting to the quarterback. Exactly. And if you can do those two things, you can do those two things and at least create games. some run game. If you don't have stars at running back, like you can create some run game. It's where the Bills. I was like, they still have not beefed up their offensive. That's line. that's the Bills' downfall because if you look at the Jacksonville game, they give up 190 yards rushing, and then they rush for 29 yards. That's a problem. Rush, you know, you're going to need a run game that's not Josh Allen. And the people, the Bills fans, so I'm like more of a casual Bills fan, you know, because being yeah. here in Buffalo and growing up, I went to Patriots games. Like, so, but I came here and I was, more, which is probably good, I was a Lions fan. So I was more of a Lions fan and I stayed with all my other, my Boston teams. But, so I'm like, I get it and I root for them. But yeah, the fanaticism and stuff is just, oh, we have injuries. Your injuries were all on defense and I give them a ton of credit. They've been good on defense with all those injuries. Your offense is really off, like really off. Where are the injuries on offense? There aren't any. Mm-hmm. So that's your problem. I'm like, the coach is doing a good job of taking over the defense and doing what he needs to do week to week to keep them in games. Your offense, even in the Dolphins game, your defense puts you in position to win that game constantly. Mm-hmm. The offense did well too, but I'm like, I don't know, just like Dallas. Like, like their Dallas has got a decent defense, but their offense only can beat teams like the Pats, the Giants, the Jets. I'm like, Play against a good team. Yeah, wa- you struggle. watching the Giants Bills game, I am no longer oh, I'm no longer scared of the Bills. It's dreadful. But watching like, them against Miami, I'm like, uh oh, I'm worried about the Bills. And then I watch Jacksonville and Giants back to back and I'm like, I'm not worried about the Bills. I'm more worried about Cincinnati coming on. I'm always worried about Cincinnati because they yeah. kinda own us. Yeah, they can have they can have their moments just like I think there's a few teams. Baltimore can have their moments where they could beat somebody, but I don't think they can make a run all the way. I just don't. I think Buffalo can have a day, They're playing really but I don't well think. Right now. I don't know if they could put three, four games together through the playoffs. I just don't see it. I was like, yeah, yeah because I was always a roller coaster. Because I told my wife the other day, I go, listen, I'm not trying to get ahead of myself. I said, but I'm just letting you know, if the Lions make Super Bowl, Griffin and I are going to Vegas. Like we're going. Like that's, we may not go to the game. But we're going there. Oh, absolutely. Week. And then there's like this one hotel that's got this like three-story TV thing right by the pool. I'm like, I could spend yeah. the game there. Yeah. I wouldn't care. Yeah. Because it's more of a corporate event. I, go, I don't care. But we're going to Vegas. And she's like, I go, 
if the Bills go, I'm like, you're welcome to go too. They're going to lose though. I go, they would lose. <laughs> I go, it doesn't matter who they're playing. I go, they can't string together three or four weeks like that. I don't have, I don't have faith that they can. Like, that's the problem. Just like Dallas can't. They can put three, four weeks together like that. No, they can't. Not, not playing good teams. No. And that's the thing about Miami, too. Miami, the one good quarterback, the one good team that they've played, they got smoked by the Bills. So, like, they haven't, they haven't played the Jets' defense yet. They have, to fa- they have to face them twice. They haven't played they have play Kansas the Eagles. City. They, they played play Eagles. Eagles Sunday night. That game. I, I kind of think that Miami could pull that one off. <laughs> Because the secondary of the Eagles is so bad for some reason. But I could see them losing that game, too. The best quarterback that they've played against is Justin Herbert, week one. And week one was wild for, with everything that went on. And the Chargers on. find a way to lose games. Absolutely. Well, that was the other. Like Justin Herbert in the fourth quarter. How many times can you have the ball with two minutes left, a chance to retire, win the game? And he never does. I'm like, why it's not like a, a pro football genius or whatever? He just goes... Well, the game's over. Year? He goes, the game is over. There is zero chance he's going to score a touchdown. Yeah. Or a field goal. He's not even going to get in field goal range. Year one of Justin Herbert, yeah. I'm like, oh, no. I, here I am thinking that Mahomes, oh, we're going to win the AFC West forever. And then and then Herbert comes in. I'm like, uh-oh, we're going to have some battles over the next 10 years. And he's like the exact same guy that he was as a rookie. He's He hasn't really progressed. He's still very, very good. But he's not... He, what's the what's his biggest win ever? A week seven Chiefs game? That's it's like a, it, that's like his best win ever. Yeah, and his fourth quarter stats are dreadful. Yeah. Like just dreadful. He's like in the bottom like six quarterbacks. They need a, they, they need a new coach though. They do need. I, a new I coach. think he's. A, uh, yeah, it's all right. They can keep him. That's good. Yeah, it's just good for going. me. Just keep going. Just keep. Keep yeah. doing what you're doing. Yeah, and. All these Bills fans always have me as like, oh, your division is such a joke. I'm like, I want my division to be a joke. Look what the Patriots did for 20 years. They they took it advantage keeps you healthier of healthier and they took advantage of a bad division, and they always played at home in the playoffs. And that's what's happening with Kansas City. I mean, Broncos are a train wreck. Raiders are in second Raiders place. Need to fire their coach. Like why it's a Raiders fan, and he's just like, I just want him to fire the coach. <laughs> I just he goes, I don't want him to win. So Patriots, fire the coach. Patriots West. Because he's like, if you guys go to the, the Lions game on Monday night, he goes, I'll go and put – he wants to bring a sign, just fire the coach with a Raiders jersey on. Just fire the coach. Like, <laughs> like he, he might get on TV and he'll have a bunch of lines. That's true. Uh, like, he's just like, just fire – he doesn't like Jimmy G either. He goes, you need to stop. They go, stop. Why? He goes, get a real quarterback. Derek Carr and Jimmy G are the same person to me. Like, why? I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand that I don't know what they're move. doing. I just don't know what they're doing. I don't either. But yeah. that's sort of, that's been the dysfunction now since I don't know. And Baltimore's playing pretty well. They're playing they're playing they pretty are. well. I mean Lamar is always a handful to defend against. What time is that game on Sunday? It's one o'clock. <sighs> what time did Chiefs play? Chiefs play at four. They played the Chargers. So that'll be that's always tough. We always Yeah, well, that's I I, I can rip I can rip I can rip on Justin Herbert and stuff, but the games are always close against yeah, that's the one Chiefs. Those, it's it's like, a divisional game. Yeah, it's like the Patriots for years would still stumble at least once against Dolphins. Like every yep. year. every year, especially in Miami. Every year. And I was like even when they were just far better, it didn't matter. Yeah. It's crazy. So, thanks for coming in though. And I mean, the whole reason why I wanted you to come in here is really we're getting an influx of interest from like five and six year olds. <laughs> and I just give them one of your little cards or I email them your information because, uh, I mean, you're in here. Yeah, if it's outside what you and, do, just like, exactly. I just sometimes I'm like, yeah. I, yeah, I just can't. Yeah. And I just want a kind of. I always complain about there's not other options than, you know, the the juggernaut in Elma, but there are other options and they're they're building other options. You, we need another facility though cuz we're stru- this year more than any other year since COVID, we are struggling mightily to get one. Everybody is everybody is emailing me almost every organization that's not named Flash 
or stallions is asking me and flash for more but training flash is time having issue flash is having major issues because of havoc Havoc. because they're taking clarence and, and taking some of the time flash had wanted and they're giving it to clarence right clarence is like taking over epic for the most part but, but then all these other with am i think the i think the stone that rib, had a ripple effect was amherst losing the village glen because now Amherst had to take over NARC. NARC kicked out Lockport and all these other smaller clubs like Kenmore. And now... Kenmore's it, up at that one that used to be a roller or ice rink or something like that. Roller, whatever where's it was. that? Um, uh, what is that? Military military and Sheridan. Okay. Like Milshire. Oh, I heard like about that. Yeah, Milshire. Um, I heard about that this dreadful. week. Like, follow, is it it's the, like almost... 90s turf, you're like, just is, like, is it the terrible. yeah, I the Astro turf? That's what's at all in sports, too. Have you ever looked in uh, all in sports? All over by all in. Oh, all in. Oh, I've been over there, but never when it's open. I've like looked through the thing, yeah, and I'm like, the one near the airport, yeah, the baseball facility. Yeah. And then Ron Brissett used to run his his uh personal uh sports performance out of there, but it's the old turf, too. I was, I was before. I had this place. I was thinking about making a move to there because it was a little bit bigger and um, there's no poles in the middle like I had at Sports Performance Park. But you're right. There's not enough facilities. Clarence is co- is contacting me about more time. They want 6 to 7 o'clock every night. And I'm like, uh, that's kind of our like, busiest time. And the t- few hours that I can give away they're already taken they're taken by you and they're taken by marcello and it's it's ridiculous how many facilities are you in for the winter um you're in here here salins and we eventually when they get back to me are going to be in uh the one up in uh lockport the oh ken ken and ken yeah Kena, or keenan center keenan center yeah i've never been there what is it? What does it consist of? Is it a full 11 v 11 field? No, it's like a boarded field, a oh, okay. large boarded, and they have a small boarded. Like right, Tomal doesn't even take the small boarded for the most part. Okay. Um, but it's like carpet. It's not. It's just carpet. But it seems to have a little fine. cushion underneath it, so that's good. Um, yeah, I mean, it. I just needed more space, and I told him like up there we did we did it right outdoors there this year for our first year at Socceroos for that. And that four to five year old group was really good for a first year. Yeah. The older group was pretty small, but I was like, that's fine. But I'm like, if we're still at like, I don't know, 80 kids, I'm like, on a Monday night, I'm like, that's okay with me. 80 kids is small? Yeah. In an hour? No. If you're talking or about just all, all, if you're talking, all age. We didn't groups. even do the, we didn't do the, the two, th- two to threes. We only did like a four, five, then a six to eight. So four to five, but, six to eight, and you had 80 kids? Yeah. Jesus. That's that small. So in the summer, where were you? Lockport? So Monday was Lockport. Tuesday was West Seneca. Um, Wednesday was Williamsville. Thursday was Orchard Park. And Friday was in Depew. So you're in five places. So the largest, depending on the age group, like the largest in the oldest age group was Depew, the six to eight. Huh. I'm shocked at how big Depew is. But other people I've talked to, other, other organizations like not soccer, are like, no, I'm not surprised at all. Like at all. Because you're pulling in, I guess, the surrounding area or whatever. I mean, yeah. The number of kids that actually live in Depew is not huge. But you're getting in, like, Lancaster, West Seneca, some of these. It's, not, it's centrally located, so it's easy to get to for everybody. Right. But I'm like, we're in a little park, too. It's not even the best space. We are totally outgrowing that park. I've been trying to get Ream Road so we can get more space and actual real goals and stuff up there. So we can do stuff with, back it up and put some stuff with mob up there, too. But trying to work a cheek to August soccer club is impossible, which I used to get along with them really well. No, not at all. So now that they've merged with, actually, it's a lot. Their board, their whole board changed over. So, at Chictawaga? Yeah. Do they ha- still have that Parks and Rec indoor facility that had a rink? Do you remember that? Is it Chictawaga? Am I dreaming? I don't know. I know they have a hockey rink right over there, but is it ice? Yeah. Or is it well? There's okay. a couple of them over there at the Pew Chictawaga area. There's a couple with. I think I know what you're talking about. I think that's an ice rink too. Yeah. Because in like 2015, when I was at Flash, I was refing for Andy somewhere, and he sent me there. 
there's just some random indoor rink. I don't know. I, I think it was Chittawaga. But, so explain mob. So how many teams do you have? You have the olders now too? Basically, they're just going to, they're going to do train, like maybe one day a week of, of t- extra training and then we'll do some random tournaments. Like that's it. It's just, yeah. are so, they all like dual carded or yeah, at other much. organizations? Yeah. Yeah. Cause that we're not, it was like, especially we're trying to fill a void of like, so let's say the kids play premier and then they're playing on a club team. Yeah. But then you're missing at least one of those two practices a week. They're never at the stuff for the travel. They're also missing a lot of the, the league games. So we're not going to do Buffalo Western. We're not doing any leagues. We'll just do some training. And it basically started with last year, me taking a few of them and going, like they went down with the Cleveland with us to do the, it's like 44, three and a goaltender. Mm-hmm. So they went to that. They went to that. They're going to win a trophy and they come back up. And then they did this, the winter one. And they win that one up at Sportsplex. And they're like, yeah, if we have enough players, can we do full side? And I was like, yeah, if you have enough players. So as we got through through spring a little bit, I talked to one of the, the dads who's kind of organized, and he's like, yeah, we got 17 kids ready to go. And I'm like, all right, well, they got I go, the club will pay for a, a tournament if they just all buy the uniform, the uniform kit. I go, the whole kit, which is 150 bucks, uh-huh. we'll pay for the kit. They get three jerseys, two shorts, two pair of socks. And yeah, for, and they're nice. It's all like three jerseys. Wow. Yeah, for 150. 150 bucks. That's not bad. No, and they're nice. Like some of the other teams and stuff. Like those are sweet jerseys. I'm like, I know because we custom them exactly the way we wanted them. Like went back and forth with the guy who lives in Amherst and does the stuff, and did them exactly the way we want. What's that guy's name? What was that company? It's custom kits. They are uh, corner kits. Sorry, cut corner kits. He does a bunch of for the BDSL. Some oh. of the BDSL teams have them. He can design them however you want. Like give them the pattern and everything okay. else. I was going back and forth. I go, no, I want like the Seahawks green and the Rams blue. He's like punched in. He goes, oh, that's sharp. I'm like, yeah, that's for one of them. Uh-huh. That one's like black with like the spiderish green thing throughout. Looks almost like like we're sponsored by Monster, whatever drink, yeah. whatever that is. And uh, another one's a little bit more just black with a little bit of kind of New Orleans colors, but it looks very like the Germany national team sort of with yeah, the, the lines. Yeah, the black and the gold. Yeah, black, gold, and white, but it's our white jersey with just black and gold with like stripes coming just through the middle, like big stripe. Yeah. So it looks pretty sharp, and, and that's more traditional, and the other two are a little bit more off. Yeah. Um, then black shorts, blue shorts, one with green socks, and one with black socks. So the only complaint I had was from some of the parents when it rained and they wanted to switch, and I go, the guys don't match. Like the first two, you can do the black jersey and the white jersey with the black shorts, but and the black socks, but I go, you put the blue green on and I go, it doesn't match. You got to put your blue shorts on and your green socks. And they're like, parents are all upset. Blah, blah, blah. Change it. Cause the little kids, you got it. They all yeah. change themselves. Uh-huh. Like you need a, need a fourth Jersey. I was like, well, let's see down the road. Yeah. That Seahawks green. That's kind of like what I was going for in the original playmaker logo. That's funny. It's funny that they did that. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen their jerseys or not. I don't know. Um. So you have the two teams, or do you have three teams? So I have now? I have two. I have basically like a U nine and a U eight, and it's co-ed. They're co-ed. We're hopefully going to have enough that we get a third team just with girls. Okay. Um. I don't know if that's going to happen this year. Right now, though, the so we're trying to do it the way I did it last year. They didn't play in winter one. They weren't ready for that. We did more small sided stuff and everything else. And then winter two, we went in. We got beat up, especially the first three weeks. Like even. Uh, Ryan, who had the flash team that was a U8, he's like, yeah, that's how we look the first three weeks. Like, the kids are just bunched. They're just trying to get them a stage. Yeah. Their spots. Because even if they have angles down a little bit in a 3v3 or 4v4, all of a sudden, 7v7, you need kids to be out here just waiting. Which also, if you're trying to develop them, like, it's not always the best. So, we're trying to get that mix. And then, um, shoot, what was thing? So, we're going to do the same thing with this. With the new kids, that's what we're going to do. We're going to have them wait and go into winter two. The older kids returning kids are going to be going into the winter one and they're going to be we were going to do fall one but there weren't enough good teams um so that's that's the one i was talking about like the black and the gold that's sweet um that's the blue green and that's the one I think oh, the kids like, yeah okay the, that one's the, sweet the kids like that one i think the best it's pretty sweet. That is pretty sweet. It looks um, like a, a spider web. It's pretty. It, it, I, I give a lot of credit to Mike who put it together. I was like, this is awesome. It's fantastic. 
um, I saw one of the BDSL teams had like this pink jersey or whatever too that was really sharp, and I was like, let's get that for the goalie for the for the girls team, yeah, the older team. So she wore that too. Got it. It's like holy crap! It's like it did a whole kit for her, all in like pink, pink and black. It was like it's awesome. Um, Wait, your older team's girls? Yeah, it's the, they were basically like like. Emma played with it. They played U16, but like Emma and Claire and a bunch of those kids. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was, it was like AFC. Corinne. It was like It was like a reunion of all the AFC kids. Uh-huh. They're like, and basically all of them, though, I said, they have to coach, they have to coach in soccer rooms. That's all. Just if you're going to play, you got to come coach. A lot of them already were. Speaking they were already coaching. Of, speaking of coaches that you have, JoJo. Oh, that sucks. And her sister, Tori, she all like two months ago. Yeah, and it's like you go from the highest of highs Announcing your your commitment to play at Kent, and then the following week or it's two. It's like two weeks because the week after she got a concussion. Then the week after that, to ACL. Oh, it's so awful. I know. At least she's she's a junior, so she has enough time to you know have That's to true. get back the, the first year. Not not necessarily one hundred percent, but That's then true. by the, the next year, she should be, should be good. Um, just yeah. looking at the positive side. That is, that's a very good point, because. If it was next year, and now it's tough because you're making that jump into college set, and you're still coming back. You back. I forgot that she's a junior. Wow. Yeah. How many coaches do you have? How many coaches do you have in a session where For there's Socceroos? 80 kids? Or, well, that night there's 80 kids, and you said three age groups? Yeah, the Lockport one we only did two though. We didn't do the Joey's, the, the twos, the threes. That one, right? Um, although I think we allowed like older threes to go in with the, the four fives. Um, so with that one, it depends on how many teams. So let's say we have eight teams, then there's eight coaches, um, but each team might only have say eight players or so on it. So it's a one to eight ratio, one to ten ratio. Not usually ten. It's usually one to six, somewhere six to eight players on a team. That's good, especially with that yeah, that and, young a player. And and I do for the first couple of weeks. I overstaff anyway, so we have extra. A lot of times I have an extra person, no matter what, in case somebody calls off, something happens. So we have an extra person, and so we have people. I mean, we bring in new people anyways, so I want them to kind of shadow and, and whatever, and kind of as soon as they can, kind of jump in and see how, see how they do. Mm-hmm. But having those extras help. Especially the first couple of weeks, you're handing out shirts, you're handing out balls, you're doing all these different things, but helping with equipment, moving things around, just that kind of thing. And I'll be like, "Hey, wh- you know, where do you want me?" I'm like, "Well, watch the fields. I'm going to bet that's the field they're going to need more help because that team's got a bunch of kids that are crazy or whatever, whatever <laughs> it is. You might need help on that one. Or this, these two coaches are not the biggest talkers, so you might need an extra coach over here because you just have that. I mean, some of the kids are, all the coaches are not equal, and yet, especially when you're, you have a lot of newer ones. Some all of a sudden, like Anna jumped in and was phenomenal. She was leading by her second week. That's uh-huh. not normal. Yeah. Um, and, or, or Claire, hey, you want to lead this group? She goes, sure. You know what you're doing? No, not at all. Like, <laughs> but I love the attitude. Like she is ready to just go and do whatever. So I'd rather have that than somebody that kind of knows, but they're kind of hesitant getting in there and they're very self conscious about what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Like, seriously, like it's worse can happen. One of the four or five year olds has to correct you and be like, yeah, you didn't, you forgot about this part. Like the beginning part's always the same. So getting them familiarity, that kind of thing, and like that's what games go. Oh, you know what? We should hire you as a coach. That's awesome. Like, you know what's going on. How do you develop the coaches, and like how do you like, how do you organize your sessions when there's multiple? Because when it's here, you usually split it into two groups, right? And then two you kind of float like four teams. So when so we still do it in four teams, sometimes indoors, okay. we may have it more academy style with all have the same color shirt, and then we divide them up with pennies. And we try to get them, even them out a bit. Maybe okay. have an A field and a B field without telling the kids that. Okay. So, or maybe all boys, all girls. It gives us that flexibility when we do academy style. And I explain to the parents when we run those. Yeah, this is why we're doing it. There's pros and cons of both ways, but they can't always be with their friends and that kind of thing. Yeah. Those are age groups. Honestly, they're usually better off not being with their friends because then the, absolutely otherwise they're because holding hands and they're doing the stuff. Not all, but some. Mm-hmm. And they're not there to socialize. The parents are, so they're just barely able to focus on the ball and going to goal. Yeah. If, three to five just that's not they're not stopping looking for their friend to pass them the ball we don't even talk about passing at that age just get the ball and go to goal yeah and that's why that's why you often do multiple balls too are you for still doing four, that for the four or fives four or fives four or fives and the, two threes uh, yeah the two uh, or th- not really so the two threes we introduce we never have actual teams but we'll separate them with pennies and we'll introduce gameish type thing where Okay, the kids got on there. Same concept, but we'll put more than our normal number of balls in the field because we're not 
trying to get them to take away from other people yet. Just get a ball from the middle, take it down, score a goal, run back to your coach. Get them in that habit of doing that so when they get the four fives, they're playing touch post. But now we're introducing going, okay, if you can't find a ball in the middle and you're on blue and you're playing against green, take it away from a green player. Right. Like we go, hey, is it okay to take away from blue? No. And they'll be like, eh, no, it's our team. We don't want to take away from blue. What about green? Do we take away from green? And they'll be like, no, no. yes, that's defense. That's the only vocabulary word. Defense means take it away from the other team. Then what? Go score. Like not, oh, we got the ball. This is cool. Or look for Joey to pass. To, no. Go to goal and score. Yep. Get the ball. Go to goal and score. Mm -hmm. Quick. Before that. And if somebody takes away from you, go take it back. Just don't use your hands. Go take the ball back. And you start getting them in the habit of that. And you can tell which kids are returning and which ones are new pretty quick. And the ones that have been with us a while, especially if they've been in the Joeys, you don't see it early on. Mm -hmm. But by the time they're five, a lot of those kids were like, maybe it's time to move to the six to eight year old group because they're just flying in and stealing balls. And we try to also match them up then going, they'll find the weakest link and you get them. So we're like, okay, let's say you got one kid, um, let's say Charlotte's over here. And we're like, Charlotte, okay, why don't you go after uh, James? And they'll be like, oh, James is good. Exactly. Yeah, go get challenge. Let's stuff. wait here for a second. Once James, good, now we'll get James. And like, boom, and try to get those matchups going. So it's really trying to do that. And obviously with the coaches, JoJo and some of the more experienced coaches are just doing that. Newer coaches, they're at the level. They're just trying to get through, get through their stuff. So I'm like, hey, that's great, but make sure we're doing this. I'm like very big on these little things. Just like as a coach for a team, yeah. do the little things. The big stuff take care of, takes care of itself. But if you ignore these little things, the product's not great. Mm -hmm. You're going to have kids in the goal, sitting down, doing this. I said keep them focused on little things. Not big concepts, just little ones. Boom, boom, boom. Just boom and send them and then verbal reward right away. That was awesome. That was fantastic. I'm like, you'll be amazed how much those kids will do if, yeah. if, you, if you just keep doing that. But if you're not enthusiastic and you're just here to like stand around and whatever, I'm like, well, you're not doing us any good. You're just like another player out here. Or like when one person's leading and they're doing their TikToks or foundations or whatever and you're just doing them along with it. If you're walking around commending players about this is super great, mm -hmm. all the kids that are standing, you can do it. Come on. Like always positive. You can do it. Oh, you know what? Some kids sitting down. Oh, you you're saving your energy for the next one. I get it. No problem at all. But I'm going to be back. Make two or three attempts. Get over there. Try to get that kid out there. Mm -hmm. If it's not his day or her day, okay. But you want to make sure you're making attempts. And it's like those little things that we go through. So like with training, I go through those with the kids. Um, the kids, the coaches, the young coaches of this is what we're doing. Like this is how, the format of it. But then within the format, these are the little things that I expect you guys to try to do. It's not always going to be perfect, but I just want to see you try. That's it. Just keep trying. But if you're standing around just watching the kids play, that's that whole, like, they just learn on their own through some kind of osmosis. They're going to all of a sudden develop skills and love of the game. Like, no, you don't have to yell at them like, you go here, you go here like chess pieces. Mm -hmm. But give them little things. Go after this player here. Oh, it's all right. You go here. There. And sometimes just get them a ball. Boom. There's clear space. But you got to go fast. They take it away. Go get it back. Like, talk to them. They're like, oh, I don't want you. No, and don't ask kids questions. Like, Come on, can you put the ball down because they're holding it? Like, n you don't ask the kids. You tell, tell them. them. <laughs> you, you direct them. Yeah. You positively, in a nice way, direct those kids. <laughs> I go, otherwise, no. No, thanks. I'm just going to hold my ball here. I, all the time, I'm like, it, rugby, I go, yeah. the kids are running with the ball. I'm like, yeah, rugby night's on Monday, which it is for Kenmore Rugby because my kids played it. So I'm like, rugby's on Monday night. And the kids are like, why do you always say that? I'm like, because my kids are rugby on Monday night. One of the first things that I had a coach tell me ever when I was coaching, when I was, I think I was probably 19, I was like, who's running the asylum? Who's like in charge? And you have young coaches, but your young coaches are in charge of like, yeah, like, like JoJo or uh, how, like Emma. How does Emma do with like. Emma is getting better. She started off pretty quiet. Yeah. That's kind of her nature. Yep. And she's definitely getting better. Or each one has their strengths. Yeah. Personality wise. And some things they have to work on. And that's How true. How do you address that? How that's true with anything though. So for example, Corinne. Okay. Corinne during the summer. Like she was actually holding one of the kids like like as a baby or something. I'm like, I get it. She's great at that. Or she was doing this little sitting around like kumbaya with a bunch of the kids. But her back was a field. I'm like, Corinne. You... <laughs> These kids are pretty happy. I go, but the parents wanted them to come to play soccer we need to get them on the field and i'm like just be more direct about this i go i love that you're so they love you yeah but they're not out on the field playing i can't get them out like they want us to just play with like no don't ask so it's just, them yeah tell them direct them and yeah. I, I said and if you need help ask me to come over or whatever or right. talk to one of the coaches but that's 
that's new. And I'm like, but she has that connection with the kids really. So she's great at that. It's just then how do we direct them to get stuff done on the field yeah. and keep it moving that way where some of the coaches too, they take a little bit too long with the whole learning their names. And I'm, I am, if I get out there and do it, I am not as good at that part. Like, Da, 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 da. I'm like, I'm just more, I talk over their head. I tell the kids, I'm like, I talk to them almost like a Shrek movie. I say stuff that goes way over their head, and I talk loud enough, the parents get it, and they're like, that was funny or whatever, and the kids have no idea. Yeah. And <laughs> I said, but it's always in a positive way and everything else, and it keeps them going. Um, but I said, you keep like chatting that way, not directing them all the time. So just like, but talking to them having, and having fun. One of my best coaches ever, um, Kayla Hartman, this is going way, way back. Um, she has, she just had, she, uh, was it a boy or no? I think she said a boy. Um, she, I would call her the Robin Williams of our coaches. She would go out there and even if I had a certain game plan to go out there, she's one of the only coaches I let do that because she could do it the way we had it. Like, this is what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. But with the youngest kids, she'd be like, Hey, where do you, we're going to take the ball on an adventure today. Where do you want to go? And they'd be like, oh, let's go to the amusement park. All right. And she'd come up with a story immediately off the top of her head. We're taking our ball here. Oh, we got to get tickets. Let's do 10, 10 toe touches to get our tickets. And then take kids to another place and then do all these different things with the ball. And I'm like, let's just watch her and see how she gets back to like getting to here. And then we move into the games or whatever. And I'm like, awesome. Or we had two coaches that showed up the last week and did, um, they had all girls in their group. Not that they couldn't do it with boys, but one was dressed as Dora and, one, and the other coach was Boots. And they did this whole like thing with Dora and Explorer and yeah. taking the ball and a thing, whatever. And I'm like, they that's going above and beyond. Like, cause, and they told me half time, hey, we're gonna do this. I'm like, yeah, go go right ahead. That's fantastic. So, fantastic. Let's do that stuff. Or JoJo saying, hey, I, it said we have certain games like we do Squid Game, not for the younger ones, but for six to eight. And I have to explain to the parents, it's red light, green light, and no one's gonna get hurt. Like, and if your <laughs> kids love this game, yeah. make sure you. If they go, hey, Squid Game's awesome. Let's watch the movie. Maybe watch it on your own first before, because it's not really for kids. Right. But the kids already know, because especially if they have older brothers, sisters, and there's YouTube, they're like Squid Game, and they love it. They get into it, um, or a Wreck It Ralph game, things like that that are in the kids' medium that they kind of know about, or whatever. Or Hungry Hippos. Um, <laughs> so doing games like that, and I said we need more games. Another one on that, and George was like, we need one like Hunger Games, and I was like, that would be awesome. Yeah. And she was coming up. I was, one, I was like, that's good, but there's too much standing for some, some of the kids on it. So we just got to find a way to do it. But you don't want to squash that creativity. Like, yes, this is good, and it's the same kind of teaching we do. And again, like, this part was good, but we had just this. It's, it's just from a coaching standpoint. So that's where we're trying to mentor the kids, but also finding their way. I want them to have their own way of looking at things. Or a coach going, hey, I'm going to try this game with this age group. And I'm like, that's more of a six to eight age group game like yeah. you're gonna struggle and she's like i think this group's good enough i go go ahead as long as you have a backup plan when it starts to go go off the rails and adjust yeah adapt so but i'm like yeah so as long as you do that and you don't just stop and go this is a mess and stand there you're panicking so that's sort of like how we do it is it they come in and they've got like week one week two all the way through week eight or however many weeks we have this is the lesson the plan. curriculum the, yes this is the curriculum when do you go over that do you go over that before they start coaching or do you go over it each week Basically both. We have the, the sheet, which honestly this past past session, even over the summer, bringing in some of the new coaches, mm -hmm. we didn't do as good a job of that. And that's on me because I had so many returning people that I was like, they already know what they they're doing. They already know the They cadence. know what they're doing yeah. and it's getting other people in. But I still should have been like for all the new people here so they can look it over. And it says like you want – like the youngest groups. And I tell the parents. We have a parent meeting so they understand the expectations. So the week, first week – the kids go out and they do their, their beginning part and then they come get their quick water break. Then I go around and I go to the parents and I explain it. Okay, so some things we do in our program are similar to every program out there, mm -hmm. but some things we do are very different. Um, the things we do differently, we think stand, help us stand out in a positive way. And there's a reason why we do it. Like the very beginning and end of the session are identical, just like the educational shows at this age group. So, which if you ever watch kids shows, absolutely. They are, the, but the middle part's going to change, so they're not bored out of their mind. But they're going to come in. They're going to have their introduction part. We're going to go over like you know if you if you do a great job, what do you get? You get the stamp at the end. Um, what the stamp do? You know, you get the big strong muscles. You get super fast feet, all this stuff. And then also find the belly button of the ball, little things like that. And then okay, we stand up, put the ball down, no more hands in the ball, and then we go into our foot. Actually, no, we do stretching. Then they, they're all, once they're stretched out. Can we chase? We're gonna chase one of the coaches. Like, hey, can you, are you as fast as Coach Wyatt? I don't know. He's pretty fast. Like, and then send him out, and the kids go chase him. 
Um, so we do that with the two youngest age groups that when they come back, we'll do a foot skills. And there'll be a, a movie of the week that we do with them as well within that. There's videos on there of how to do them. Right. So parents, if they want to work on something at home, there's something to work on. Um, then when they come back out, then there'll be something different like uh, Shaky Bridge or Snake Pit or Racket Ralph game or Hungry Hippos. Each week that part's going to change. Then when they're done with that part, they'll, we'll put all the balls or whatever and they're going to go play their game. So then we play the game. So that is our structure each week. And at the end, they get their stamps because everybody does a great job. But the four fives and then the six eights, we do a player of the week. So we're kind of hitting both things. You have parents that are like, I want something that's not just everybody gets it no matter how well, well they played. Right. But also everybody did put an effort in. So everybody's going to get something that they look forward to. Like if you forget the stamps one, we were like, where's the bag of the stamps? And like, kids will riot. Where's my <laughs> stamp? Uh, <laughs> so it's just little things like that that you might say, I've talked to some people like, oh, that's just gimmicky. And what? You know what? The kids love it. Anything yeah. the kids love, fantastic. Right. Um, Halloween time, candy stuff. If it's around St. Patrick's Day, we'll do something with green stuff. Fourth of July, we'll do like the red, white, and blue uh, lays or whatever. Like anything we can do where the kids are like, get some jacked up about the program, great. And while we're doing that, we do think we're actually teaching soccer stuff to them. Um, nice. And like I said, with the four or fives, if it's four against four, four balls. If it's three against three, three balls. If it's five against five, five balls. And I've talked to other clubs about that. I'm like, it really works. I, and I explained to parents, I go, you're gonna look at this and your first impression is gonna be, this does not look like the Man City game I just saw on exactly. TV. Exactly, this and is I'll be chaos. Like, you are 100% correct. I said, I'll tell them, I go, but first things, we, we probably can all agree that no matter what we do with four and five year olds, it's not gonna look like TV on soccer, or see, <laughs> soccer on TV. I said, but we're gonna create opportunities that are more realistic to the game because if, if we're playing it, when we play touch with us, you're going to create more one against one, one against two, some breakaways here and there, which you 100% are going to see on, on a professional match. I said, what you'll never see, I said, I'll go back to the traditional way. If you can show me a professional game on TV where there are 22 players within three yards of each other, exactly. smashing the ball <laughs> and then chasing it all around the field. I said, if you can show me that and it looks good, like the product's good, I'm like, yeah. then that's what we'll do. But it's not realistic. So no. as much as overall you look at it and go, well, this is crazy. It, it's organized chaos. But what we're getting out of it is exactly what we want. One against ones where they have the time and space to try the moves that we've worked on. Try the little things and defensively to have a chance, not just, and we stress hard with the kids. Do not just kick the ball. Do touch, especially with that six to eight group and they start being able to hit the ball harder. Ball comes in or defending and just kick. To touch, prepare it and not trap it. I hate that word. I'm like, prepare the ball to dribble, pass, or shoot. Your first touch, sometimes stopping it right in front of you is a great play. Most of the time it's not. You should be pushing it to your right, to your left, maybe pulling it back. Prepare the ball for what you want to, to do what next. you want to do it. And then whether you continue to dribble, pass, or shoot. Because when you just kick the ball away, we've given the ball away. And whether it's this age group or you're talking about, again, Man City with Pep, like what's his main thing? Don't give the ball away exactly like, don't give the ball away so we want to possess whether you want to possess to attack or whatever boy I like to do or just at times in the game just to keep the ball mm -hmm. but you need to be able to possess even if that means it's four or five you're not passing that's the other thing we don't talk about passing none of my coaches will ever talk about passing until until, the, until six to eight age group. until six to eight okay because when you have that like it'll be like oh well in a traditional house league well hey, you'll tell one of the top players you know what why don't you pass to Johnny Johnny hasn't had the ball yet our motto is, screw Johnny. He can get his own ball because there's four or five other balls Exactly. Out there. there are other opportunities to get a ball. So he doesn't need you to pass him the ball. When you get it, I want you to take players on and go to goal. And if we start taking our best players and telling them that they just need to pass the ball, give other people a chance, not passing because it's the right, right opportunity to pass, but just pass to pass, I think that's dreadful. Even at the six to eight group, I'm like, don't just pass to pass. Or one of my coaches was like, we need five passes before you can shoot. I go, no, 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 don't ever say that either. Yeah. This is a developmental league. I go, they get the ball and they can't be, I go then, we'll move kids field to field. Right. We'll do other things we move need to up, do. Move them down. Yes. Yeah. But don't stop the kid. From scoring. From scoring. From I taking go, players on. I said, no, if he's dribbling and there are three players on him and somebody's open far post, I'm like, then that's what we say. Cut the ball back. Let's serve it far post. Yep. And I go, that's a teachable moment. Well, you know, because, oh, he's got 20. Okay. But work with the other players to get in the right spot. If you haven't moved to the right spot, I'm going to allow that player to even take on three or four players. Yeah. And, and we even do that with mop. Like, and, if you haven't moved to the right spot and called for that, 
And a couple of my players are smart enough. Like Vincent will be like, he didn't call for it. And I go, Vincent, you saw him though, and it was open. Exactly. Go, so I'm going to actually make you pass the ball. But you're right. They still should call for it. Right. But you saw it. Whenever I was in a situation with you know the one player who had somebody wide open, all you got to do to solve that problem is, did you see them? Did you did you see them? And then a lot of times they'll lie and say, no, I didn't see them. I'm like, well, next time, look for them. And then the very next time they're in that same situation or same type of situation, they'll almost always pass. Whereas some coaches, you'll see them and you'll they'll just like scream at their player for for not you know making the pass. And we don't even know what the kids saw at times, right? But the cha- the the chaos thing is is so funny to me because you're saying five v five and five balls. That's brilliant because what it what it creates is chaos. And then how do we treat being calm? You got to throw them in some chaos and see who and, is calm to solve the problem. And you you have your one v one. Let's say, but there are other players in your way, and there could be sometimes it's one v two. Exactly. But you're going to be challenged and have to get through that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you'll have a breakaway, and I'm like, it gives you realistic opportunities. If you're going to breakaway, you better go quick because someone at some point is going to realize I can't get a ball. I'm going to come get yours. Yes. So it's trying to get them to go. And again, you have kids of all different varying experiences and stuff like that. Yeah. But it fits. And the other thing we do, which is unique when we go outdoors with the six to eight group, especially when our numbers are, are such, we can do it. Then our teams might go to anywhere from eight. We might even go to nine or ten. But we split them for the games. We have two fields. So let's say the blue team will have a 3v3 or 4v4 on one field and 3v3 or 4v4 on the other field. Mm -hmm. And the red team will have also. So within that now with the coaches, we could put, say, all of our best players on one field, all of our newer, more less experienced on another, or all of our boys on one, all of our girls. We can move those players around even though we already have set teams. We can move those players around to set up the matchups we want. Otherwise, you do have kids that are just going to be out there dominating the field, each team having, and it seems like a 1v1 within a mass of other, like, human cones. And we don't want that. Mm-mm. Because we go to one ball, it's 6 to 8. So then it's like, if we don't have the ball, where you go? And it's still a slow go. Yeah. It really, really is. So I'd say that's, and we don't think we have all the perfect answers to everything. We're always looking to change and adapt to however we think it might help right. make it better. Um and we put our up and stuff with that age group because otherwise kids are goaltending on the small rules. We're trying to get them to just step up and challenge. Um, whatever we can do. And we're still playing touch post because we, we felt like if we stop for kickoffs, you're sitting it there and very often the team loses it and it's almost a breakaway in every time. How, how do you keep retention? You know, like, so if, if you have November and December mm-hmm. coming up, and then obviously you have January and February session, and then you have March and April. How many do all three? For instance, in here on Sundays, how many players do all three? There are a few. Is it pretty good? It, there are a few, yeah. I mean, our numbers, and it works out, I guess, for us that you have more kids that are going to play in the summer, because, which helps because we have more space. We're limited to space, and we're not going to pack 50 kids in here. No. Um, just... I've seen that in house league programs. They'll just throw as many as they can in a gym, as many as they can. And I don't what know. do you limit it in here? 20, 25? Yeah. Depending on the that, age. Around, around that, that area. Because, I mean, you can do it where, we let's say, you have 3v3, 3v3, you know, three three, three three, um, and that. But, I mean, with the younger kids, if you can go up to 5v5 on each side. So you could put 20 easily, have all the kids playing the whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, four or fives, we try not to do too much with subs if possible. Just let them play. Kids on their own are going to need to stop and get water. But it's that mass, you know, it's it's the organized chaos anyways where I'm like, it's fine. Or if one team has six instead of five, whatever, it's fine. Mm-hmm. I was like, it's going to work. It'll be fine. You get to the next age of one ball, an extra player makes a big difference. So then you're playing 3v3 or 4v4. Um, I like 3v3 better, but especially when they go to mob. I like 3v3 as much as we can or three and a goaltender because it's a traditional format and I've, talked with high level coaches about that if you do 4 4 it's like the sports flex tournament that player at the bottom of the diamond is basically like a goal they're just blocking the goal mm-hmm. they're a defender but they're blocking the goal and they're small goals yeah so I was like I'd much rather have it where you just make it a bigger goal and put a goalie in there and let the other teams act because otherwise you're just blasting it through that player yes so make it more realistic and have that opportunity or play a true 3v3 because then the kids are moving off the ball and it's more fluid instead of mm-hmm. just going 
yeah, you're my wide players, you're my target player, and stay in the diamond, and your job is just to run up and down, and your job is just be our target. I'm like, no, I want movement off the ball. Pass, you know that we need, th- you know, basically those spots covered, mm-hmm. but making decisions off the ball that are a little bit more difficult, I would say, at first, but makes it more fluid and natural as you go, as opposed to just, otherwise it's like saying, play third base and first base and wait for the ball to come to you. <laughs> I mean, if you want to make it as boring as baseball, nothing is baseball, because I like baseball, but for young kids, <laughs> it is tough to stand there and just wait for your turn to get the ball. Absolutely. So it's that kind of movement off the ball is what you want. Um, does it take a while longer? Sure, but it's harder to defend once you get it going. It's much harder to defend. Yeah. So, and, I, and I've seen that once in a while. When we play teams that can do that, even at U10, and you play, and I'm like, oh, these guys are awesome. I love playing teams like that. Even if we get beat up, I'm like, look at what they're doing. They're doing stuff that we're, we're trying to learn right now. So it's good. I think that's the only thing. But I, I have a little pet peeves about stuff for that with you soccer. I'm like, go play whoever you're going to play. People complaining about get. We got beat up a bunch of times, and we sometimes I hate it when we beat up teams too much. Yeah. But it's finding a perfect balance all the time is really hard. It's really hard. When you're getting beat up with mob, are you playing the same age group? No, like if we go indoors, you're most playing of, two or three years up. Most of the teams in a U10 are going to be the top of the age group. They'll put their teams outdoors in the tournaments and stuff, but indoors they won't do that. Most mm-hmm. of the clubs, they're going to put their top of the age group team in. And I'm like, well, we're not waiting. We're putting our kids in now. Right. We're still going to do small side, but they need to learn 7v7. Um, so we got beat up. But, for example, we played, I think it was a West Seneca team who ended up playing in the championship against Flash. And their coach came over about halfway through the game, or somewhere, maybe the second half. And he came over, and he's like, how old are your kids? It's like six and seven. <laughs> he's like, I thought so. He's like, they're really good. He's like, you're not going to win any games in here, but he goes, they're good. Absolutely. Because their skills are actually better probably than our skills. He said, but my team is bigger and faster, and we're just going to win. He goes, I got a bunch of great athletes. I said, our kids are good athletes, but they're two, three years younger. So, yeah, they're going to get beat. Mm-hmm. Said, we just try to keep it on little things. Again, you know, can we do little things within it? And it's hard. And, and the kids even in there, like, when are we going to play teams your own age? I'm like, we can't control that right now. All we can control are these things. You show me. I said, you get the ball, and somebody doesn't run down line. Somebody doesn't give us a through option. Somebody doesn't give us a support option. I go, it doesn't matter who we're playing. Yep. I said, just do the little things, and then keep working on the little things. I'm like, keep your feet on the ground with the throw-ins. Stop throwing the ball straight across the middle of the field. I go, we haven't won one of those balls ever. Ever. We lose that every time. Part of it because the kids are older, but I go, it's a bad ball. I go, it's a bad ball. It's a bad decision. So trying to teach them some strategy, tactics within it of like, this is a high percentage. This is what we're going to look for first. And go quick. Yeah. We want speed of play. Ball goes out, boom, people are in position, and we go. Ball goes out, we don't stop playing. And trying to drive those things home for, yes, seven-year-olds, six-year-olds, eight-year-olds. Try to get them in the habit of that instead of, I don't know, the ball goes out and then bring the defender up. Like, I don't care who throws the ball. Pick it up, boom, somebody go. I don't yeah. care if it's a set position. We'll adapt off of it. And no, I don't want our, our player to the back to run all the way up and get us down the line. You could tell that player to slide over there. But communicate, let's get in position early. One of, one of the best feeder clubs in Michigan had that philosophy of, we're going to build U6 teams, but they're going to play U8. And they're going to get smashed every single game. Then when they're 7 and they're still playing U8, a little bit better, they win a game here or there. Which is what and I then, this year. And then 8 and 8... They're like the best. Then by the time they're 12 or 13, they send them off to the ECNL on the girls' side or the MLS Next Area teams well, or GA. I think it's also about like the goals. My goal for the players, and I told the parents when they're in there, I said, because sometimes you're going to look at it and look at short-term goal versus long-term goal. Now, yeah. If there's two minutes left in the game and we have a chance to win or tie a game and it's close, I'll put the players out there to try to win the game if we can. Mm-hmm. But overall, my goal is to try to get the players – to be the type of players I want at 15, 16, and 17 years old, not to just win the game today. Otherwise, I would just put, like on our team, I would just put Vincent up top and serve the ball to the top, yeah. and we would win a bunch of games. Absolutely. But it's not going to teach anything. Now, at some point, I do think, and I heard a coach one time, well, we played a great game, but they did this. I go, did you teach the kids to adapt and drop off, though? Well, no, it's just, it's not true soccer. I'm like, it, our job is to adapt to whatever they throw at us. Exactly. That's it. And this was an older team. This was not a young team the coach was complaining about. Well, they just well the keeper just punted it over our heads and got two goals that way. Why'd they get the second goal that way? Once you why why would you see his range, why wouldn't we drop our mids and every like I don't 
that's just whining. Like, don't do that. And you're building excuses for your players. And I don't think that's okay. It's, we adapt to what's out there. But that said, I'm not going to just serve it again to our, our fastest player. We're going to play, try to play within a system, but at the same time, like, hey, they're playing all the way up here in, in a high offside line. Let's look and try to play some balls in between those backs and run them a little bit. Like, we're going to adapt to what they're giving us. Like, if they're going to squeeze that space, we're not going to play a short passing game. We're going to go through and try to spread them out. And I'll talk to young kids about it. Like, so that they start to understand the, the why. Right. This is what we're going to do because of this. It's not always going to work. But against these guys, that's what's going to work right now. So I think that it's treating the kids like their age, but not ignoring like bigger tactics about that in terms of a game. How many, how many, of, how many on your mob teams, or or do you ever get pushback from the parents of, well, why are we playing eight year olds, or is it just about on your point, educate them of why we're doing this? and then go from there? I think, and again, I don't always do it perfectly by any means. Um, I think it's trying to explain the, what, what we're doing, why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we, we want to go play games. There's nobody else to play. We'd just be sitting on a training. There's nobody else to play. Um, and just trying to get the big picture of like, we want to make sure they're still having fun. Like if you're getting, it's above your head and getting beat up all the time and it's not fun, then kids are going to quit. Um, if you're just beating people up all the time, you're going to develop a lot of bad habits. Yep. It's not going to be great for you. Um, and explain them. We can't always find that perfect, perfect sweet spot in the middle. But this is what we're going to do. We're going to try to find things. We'll go down to Cleveland, not for big travel, because I like that format of three and a goaltender. And it's a one day trip. You go down, you play the tournament. And I like that tournament also because they have these enormous trophies. And it's only for the first place team. And it's every player on that small sided team. So they all walk out with a big trophy. And I'm like, that older girls team went and won it. But I'm like, mm -hmm. my younger teams have yet to ever win that. And I'm like, but what's the worst? They just look at it and they go, we need to come back and, and win that next time. Like, or, you know, we're going to get better. Like, that's the attitude. So if you have seven-year-olds and they're just like, that's their attitude, even though they may have only won one or two out of four games, mm -hmm. and they got smashed one of the games, they're like, it's okay. Or And I explaining to them, like, hey, the one game, you guys got beat by more because the free kicks, the kick could hit over everybody's head in the goal. I'm like, I go, that team wasn't the best team. I go, the one team that won the tournament – you guys played great, and then we lost four to three. I go, I'm proud of you guys. That was a great game. That was just a great, great game. Mm -hmm. Some other team you beat up, yeah, that was that was good. But I'm like, the best game we played was this one. Like you started to play good defense. We hustled back. Little things like that. Keep it in perspective. To, it's, I think I talk to them just like I would an older team about that stuff. Absolutely. Like build the positive, but don't sugarcoat stuff. I don't think players ever just love it being like, you guys were awesome today, and it's like. We got our asses handed to us. Like, like kids know at that age too. Like, yes, they know. Like, you can't just sugarcoat that stuff. Um, as far as like with parents, you're always going to have somebody. And I always, I, I try. I've gotten much better over the years of not taking it personally. That, um, well, first of all, like, let's say a player wants to leave, and a parent says we're going to leave because of whatever the reasons are, and they're yeah. going to go to a club. Where I'm like, I know the training's not as good. I know the competition they're not playing as well or is as good. Um, but you know what? If that kid's going to be happier there, because whether it's playing with friends or whatever the case might be, or they can be the dominant player. Mm -hmm. That's one that happened last year. One of the kids left, and he could be a dominant player in Club X playing at this level that's not the same. Who's to say I'm wrong? That kid's happy. The parents are happy. They're happy with it. Like... Who am I to say, well, that's a huge mistake. That kid's happy, and they weren't as happy here. They were playing on both teams. They're happier there. Right. There are reasons to go into that. And I just explain, like, hey, we're doing this. Like, they thought we should be doing more passing. And I go, I would love to be doing more passing. But this is where we are, and the kids have to develop the ability, 1v1 first, and then the spreading out, getting in position. And I go, it's going to happen. Some of the kids are still ball hogging it. I said, and we're working on it. But I don't. They're not 14 ball hogging it. They're seven or eight exactly. ball hogging it. I'm like, they don't, as good as they are at times, they don't see the whole field the way you do from your chair on the sideline or me coaching the game. They don't have that vision yet. So it's just keep explaining it. And at some point, yeah, maybe saying, pulling them out and going, listen, we had that player that we talked about. I'm going to pull you out. And next time I'm going to keep pulling. I'm not going to sit you the whole game, but I'm going to pull you out. I need you to hit that. Path. I need you to find that pass. That mm -hmm. player was there and they're calling for it. Or whatever the case might be. But you don't hammer kids right away. 
because oh, well, Jimmy was open. We can get back. Explain it to them. Yeah. Work through it because you don't. If you hit it too hard too, then they're just like as soon as they get it, they want to pass because they think that's to make the coach happy. That's what they want. And I'm like, no, no, no. I just want us to make better decisions sometimes. Like you saw, you had three players on it. Well, I didn't see anybody open. Okay, cut it back. Look for this. Just try. Or the younger kids. I'm like, including one of my sons. I'm like, once you get down there, I go, just cross the ball. I, there's nobody there. I go, if you wait till you see the player, it's too late. You need, just trust me. And he hit one of them just even in training session. He hit one across, and as soon as he hit it, he was like, because we had two target goals, and he mm -hmm. hit it across to the other target goal, and he just immediately did this and was like, see? And I was like, but then a kid came running in and put the ball in. I go, <laughs> even though he wasn't in perfect position, that was such a good ball, and we had enough close enough to the position that we still got the goal easy yeah. because we changed it because the other team was swarming to the ball. I said, imagine if that player was really where they should have been. It would have been like he could have had it had a sandwich, a little something to drink, and then put the ball in it. I go, he was there all day. I was like, so it's just teaching him. I go, get that positive off. But yes, if you wait to see it. But that at that age, I can't get on, whether it's my kid or there's four or five kids that age group, that is a seven-year-old issue. Like the kids don't, they want to see it before they pass it. Even though I'm telling them the space is there, the player's coming. They can't see that. So it's, it's just trying to get them to be like, trust me, it's there. And if it's not, I'll get on that player. But if you never serve that ball, I can't, I'm going to keep getting on you. Because you've beaten three players down the touchline and you didn't serve the ball and you've got players coming on. You're not getting the goal. You're not. Right. Like, trust me. Not that always that's going to be the ball. Right now, that's, especially at this age, that's a good ball. And where to play it. Like, play it around the six, between the six and the penalty mark. And that kind of, like, where the six yard line is. I'm like, get the goalie to commit, play it across the six. I'm like, things like that, where not just cross it to cross it. Or, when we talk about passing now with the kids, we have certain drills we work on, and I'm like, pass to the foot. Which foot? And telling seven-year-olds, I don't want you to just pass it to, to yeah. Jimmy or Joey or Susie. Pass it to this foot, and then the why. Like, they're showing to the ball, is the man on? Pass it to this back foot. And they, they know right away, they go, because he can shield. I go, yes, yes, these kids are pretty smart for seven. They can shield. Okay, if they can turn, front foot. And they're like, yeah, front yep. foot, because they can turn and go to goal. Okay, but then you need to not just pass them, pass the correct exactly. foot. Exactly. If you get them to focus more on it, their passes get better even though they're not perfect. They're not. But they start to focus instead of just going and hitting it toward that player in that general direction and thinking that's good enough. You've raised the bar, but you're not like hammering the kids when they make mistakes. Just try. I want to see you try to do this. Yeah, and I think that I always, I always tell kids or I ask kids, I go, hey, are you currently playing at the highest level that you want to play at? No. The answer is always no. <clears throat> and so they don't understand the concept, or a lot of coaches don't teach the concept that just playing it to a person at that next level that you want to attain, it's not, it, it's, not, it's not a completed pass at the next level. It's not good enough. And it's just that attention to detail is missing in a lot of youth soccer that I see, in college soccer that I see. It is. But it's, it starts here. Exactly. And a lot of coaches don't think that co young kids like the six and seven year olds are capable of more or, or of understanding more. But it's understanding what more means. Yes. Because sometimes they're going to higher concepts that you go, they're not ready. They're for not that. ready for that. But yes. Certain little things they can. Yep. Or if they have the ball on the left touch line, use your left foot because they'll hit it and it go curls out of bounds uh -huh. or they hit it way toward the middle. And I'm like, and you'll see them move their hips around to use it. And I was like, you must pass the ball down the left touch line with your left foot. And just be on. It. No. Not just move the left foot of players to the left side of the field. Exactly. Everybody has to be able to do that. I don't expect you to be better with your opposite foot, but you need to be competent with your opposite foot. And you can't hide it. No. Yeah. No. And that's where I do see it's a mix on our team, but we have a few kids now. They're pretty darn good with both feet. Mm -hmm. Like, And I'm like, that's... I'm proud of those things. And that's where I think those benchmarks we used to do with AFC of like you hit certain age groups, you should, by the, by the time you're graduating out of U12 and going up to 11 v 11, mm -hmm. you should be competent with both feet passing the ball 10 to 20 yards. How many kids could do that? Like, yeah. it's, it's not great. It's not great. Kids going to U13 should be really good at passing the ball 10 to 20 yards with their opposite foot. And they're not. Do you do benchmarks with soccer roos? With the soccer roos, it's more about the instruction of what we're trying to do. Okay. So that 
we're not going to judge each kid or start rating the kids or give them like those kind of things. Evaluations. Yeah, evaluations. Yeah. Even with mob, we do, and I've done it in the past with an age group, and some parents absolutely love it. Like a big thing we did through like the, the Zoom thing or whatever, like uh, Zoom reports. Fantastic. There's a whole list of things and put your comments in. It's super cool. And then you can judge and it keeps track of it like every couple of months that you do it. It's fantastic. The downside of that is what are the metrics? What are the measurements? They have a, it's basically the same as even older players, but, but you go through and what makes sense that you can like check off and put oh, on there. Okay. Um, but the downside? The downside is <laughs> you're going to have too many parents that are looking because if you're going to realistically rate a young kid, they're not going to, you need somewhere to grow. So yeah. you're rating these things and then they're going to be like sitting Johnny down and going, hey, you need to work on all these things. And I'm like, we're going to sit down and just talk about this is number one and then possibly two, and that's it. This is the one thing I want you to work on. Yep. Each kid is going to be slightly different. A lot of them will be same, but some will be different. Like, this is what I need you to work on. Like, for example, I'll use my own kicks. Like, I think I'll be like, Leo, you need to be able to, when you dribble it down, find when to pass the ball. Yeah. And nobody, I mean, stop telling me nobody's open. I said, you need to cut it and look whether it's that pass or different, you know, different things. I go, that's what you need to work on. I said, or, but like he and Vincent and Owen, are really for the most part for their age are really good at pressure cover like they understand to cover for each other yeah the rest of our kids it's like foreign language and like they think they're doing it right and I'm like cover always cover for that last player I'm like somebody's pressuring we need to cover cover doesn't mean stay you know square with them I'm like or right flat yeah, with them. like I need you to drop off and trying to get them to do that which again is a tough concept at age but that's what we'll work on and a lot of kids just don't want to play defense and but we're still gonna rotate them back but mm -hmm. yeah, you're playing a tournament I'm like we're going to put kids back there to belong, but they're also going to get more playing time just because they go, all right, who really wants to play defense? And like one hand goes up out of like six on the bench and you go, I need somebody to play defense. And sometimes you put them and they force them to go in. Mm -hmm. But close games or whatever, yeah, I'm still going to play the same three, four kids back there because they know how to play. But I also let those kids dribble the ball up. Like they can carry it out of the back. Absolutely. So, and then cover. Yeah, for and we have leads. some central meds and stuff like that that can – drop and cover for those kids. And right. The kids start to gravitate towards certain things they're better at, but you don't want to pigeonhole them either. Like the two there and the two or three that play in the back are all really good with the ball. So eventually, I remember going back to the girls team, uh, Claire and Monet were the two that could do that. Mm -hmm. They caught on to pressure cover faster than any two and they could handle the ball. Right. I don't think Claire ever plays in the back line now. She's a center mid. Mm -hmm. So, and I think Monet probably should, but she gravitates, she gravitates back. Yeah, she likes to see more, the field. Yeah, she, I think she's playing outside back right now, right? Yeah, probably. Think, yeah. But it's one of those things that I could tell with Claire. I'm like, and even before COVID and stuff, and I could see like at some point that team was probably going to make a jump, especially at COVID. So, yeah, that kid, I was starting to push her. I'm like, I want you to try center mid. I'm like, because you're so talented, not that you don't want those kids at center back, but I need you to also try these other things too. Get them out of their comfort zone. Um, and you move kids around at U10 to different spots. Everybody should have a chance to try you know, a target or, or be on the width. But some kids just like having their back to either the touch line or be in the back where they can see everything. Mm -hmm. Some don't like being in the middle of the field. Other kids thrive on that. Like they just keep gravitating to the center of the field. Um, so, I mean, it's one of those things. Like my son Griffin does better in the middle. I'm like, he does. He can play out wide. He's just, he's fine there. But I'm like, probably that's going to be his position. But then again, I don't coach him. So it's up to whoever, whoever plays him. How, how many kids on mob came through soccer roos? All of them? Um, most. Let's just talk about the younger team. Most. Almost all of them. Most. And then even with like the team that we had with AFC that came out when we were doing Happy Feet, Happy Feet, most of them came through there. But then once you have like the U10 team, like this past year, so our first time playing U10 with our you know six, seven-year-olds. Um, and after a couple of tournaments, we had coaches from other teams, coaches, either talk to me after the game or email me after the game or call me and ask when our tryouts were because they liked what we were doing. Like one was a parent was like, I think the wife of one of the coaches and just like, we just liked the way you talk to the players. We liked how you ran your team, how your team plays. And okay, great. You know, I'll keep your number and send you the info or whatever. We'll post it up on the website. You know, don't be afraid to contact me if you don't, I don't get back to you because I will forget sometimes. Right. Get back to people, but I will post it up there. Um, so we'll get people come in through just out of attraction. We don't go and like hand out things to like we see a star player. Hey, come try out for our team. No, we don't do that. It's out of attraction. Like if people are like they like what it's they see. A, it, yeah, it's out of attraction, and then it's also out of soccer rules. Yeah, 
Yeah, the majority of those players. The best players are through mostly yeah. so soccer So we're identifying rules. players all the time in soccer rules, whether it's four or fives that maybe should move up to the six eight groups because you don't want kids you want kids to always have a healthy challenge. Right. Um, and we don't make the kids move up. We're always like, hey, maybe come out and try it next week, try the older group. And the same thing with the older group. Hey, maybe come out and try training with uh, with, with the mom group this week. And we did that a few times, especially at the Williams location where I'd, we just had, and it's always a random one. We just seem to have more numbers in our junior roofs that were pretty darn good. So we first try to get them to come over, and then we start to move the team and stack fields where they play against each other. Then I had mob training right after them, or at the same time, basically, mm-hmm. on another field. And then go, okay, let's have you guys slide in, stay with the mob team, and go that. And, yeah, some kids, you can see, like, they are – it's okay, but they, they kind of just like where they are, and that's 100% fine. There's no need to rush a kid at six years old or seven years old to make that jump. And the, But then other kids, you can see them just their eyes light up and go, this is awesome. Mm-hmm. Like even if they're getting their butt kicked against certain players, just like this, this is what I want. And the parents are like, yeah, this is what we want. I'm like, so you figure that out, which is way better than just two or three tryout dates of kids coming in and trying to randomly figure it out, which obviously you have to do, but it's great when you can kind of already have a feel for it and those kids that let's say are they go up but the challenge is a bit they're kind of that in between kind of bubble we'll tell them okay you can still go back into soccer ruse and play for free anytime you want like mm-hmm. in the juniors just let me know where you're going we'll throw you in and play um and some of those kids did that last year a couple of them are still doing a little bit now and i'm almost like we're gonna have to probably be like you can't you're just dominating too much in juniors like it's not i don't even know if it's helping you now right like and you're just crushing everybody so but you do want to make sure you're building that confidence where if kids are playing up all the time, they need to have a taste of confidence once in a while. So that's why I'm like, kids that are maybe, it feels like they're on the cusp, but they're not quite there. Hey, just jump in soccer rules once in a while. I'm like, play some of those too. Mm-hmm. We, it's a pace a little bit slower, uh, speed of play and everything. And, you know, it's a mix of, of level of players. So, I mean, I wish every kid that we identified would come and play with us, but it doesn't always happen. Sometimes they're good athletes, they're playing multiple sports. They play start. Yeah, or they just, you know, geographically where we're training doesn't make the most sense for them or day of the week. They have a bunch of things going on. I get it. Um, my kids did, did rugby, and they were like, one of our kids to play more rugby. And I'm like, yeah, four kids are already going all over the place. I'm like, I would love to, too. I just don't know how many days in the week we can do that. That's crazy that you had that many players. I mean, when, when did you do the switch from Happy Feet to creating Soccer Roos? So it was just – it was – a few months, not quite a year before before COVID, um, not knowing that was coming, that we had worked out with uh, the guys, and I love the guys over at Legends, love them. Yeah. Um, but it was one of the things like with with happy people, their biggest thing is doing stuff in daycares. We did really didn't like that, so jumping yeah. into that wasn't so much. I loved when I saw the Legends teams. I wanted to know when I was like, before I even got in, involved with those guys, looking at what programs out there do want to kind of emulate and looking at like FC Delco or uh, PDA and stuff like mm-hmm. that. But with legends, their players, every position on the field were so, so attacking style. and mm-hmm. good. Everybody can um, do a one-on-one. Everybody yes. worked on shooting. And the more I read about it, stuff like that, I'd seen their teams, but also just like, and I'm like, this is great. So I went out there and visited with those guys. I liked their training facility and how they set it up. It was their old yeah. one, not their huge one now. Mm-hmm. But, um, and with their rooms, right? And, and Andy Barney is, he's awesome. Like he is, and he'll even say he does, you know, you don't have to believe quite the extent he does, but he's like 2v2 up to the age of 18. And that's all they need. And I'm just like, yeah, that's too radical for me. But a little bit. But, <laughs> but at the same but time. But if you train like that. But especially nothing... for those younger age groups, I thought that was phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so we got involved with, with Happy Feet and got involved and had like a, a franchise. The downside with that was, um, after doing it for years, and we were really successful building it from like 22 kids up to a few hundred kids, it was, um, but we weren't doing daycares. Like we did a little bit, and I was like, that's not for me. That's not what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And I had already run youth leagues before, so it wasn't like I was new to it, learning how to do it. Um, I had run it with Hamburg Soccer Club and working with their their house league. Um, and just wanted to have something, though, where I could make the decisions without going through a board of people that may or may not know much about soccer. I want to be able to make those decisions, and I can experiment and do what I want. Mm-hmm. Um, things work great, if they, and, and if they don't, it's on me either way. Um, 
So doing that and then being able to hire coaches for every single age group instead of having volunteers. I just found that it, going back even 20 years ago, it was getting to the point where that's the, the scenery was changing. It's not the 80s and 90s. You can get a few volunteers, but getting enough for a big program is like twisting arms and then most of them are great. And then what are you going to do, fire a volunteer? they are kids in the program. They can't do that. Right. So there's a bunch of issues that go along with that. So the Happy Feet thing went well. Um, but... We had to give basically ten percent of, like the gross. No, yeah, the gross. Ten percent gross. Gross. When you go. That indoors, was their fee. Yeah. So when you, but when you go indoors and you have all those other expenses, those aren't. Taken yeah, into the ten percent isn't. It's much. It, no, it's ten percent is going to kill you if you're trying to like stay in in the black, not in the red when you're going indoors. So it was one of those things that basically I told the guy. I said, listen, we came to an agreement. Like we're not going to do. Like they have a bobcat ball and stuff. We're not going to do some of your your custom things that are for Happy Feet. Um, we're not going to do the nursery rhyme things. They're really big on nursery rhyme stuff. Yeah. My two older kids went through that program and they hated that part. I mean, a lot of kids loved it, but like everything is a nursery rhyme. You know, squishing the bumblebee and stuff like that for your thing. <laughs> it's great and it has its place. It's great. Um, but I was like, I want to be able to incorporate some of the things I learned through there, which are just regular soccer things, but. Leave those things, not do daycares, and we came to an agreement. Yep, okay, great. So we're going to do that. So if somebody wants to open up one here, they can go do that and do the daycares. We're not doing anything in daycares. Right. Not a problem. Um, and just run our own program. So then we just, okay, great. COVID hit, so our first summer that we were going to be doing that, pretty much we had to reimburse everything on that, and that, that year went, just went away. Also, those AFC teams, which were built up to then, we weren't big enough to, that I felt comfortable spending bunch of money indoors not knowing if we're going to be able to get that money back if things went th fell through and I didn't know if we're going to end up training going into that winter so those teams I told everybody else like yeah we're just going to hold off for a year so obviously those kids scattered some went to Empire and now we're in Rochester and some of the kids are flash mm -hmm. um, and they're doing well like I always look at it and go we take a lot of pride in the fact that that many kids like on the 2010 team that are in the starting lineup came through our program that many kids on their, their top 09 program came out of our program. Mm -hmm. Those are AFC kids. That's why we put a tur tournament team together or the coaches and you go, these coaches are these kids and those kids will be end up at some of those big name, bigger schools and stuff like that as they get older. It's like, Absolutely. We aren't the only ones that did that, but we help give them a base to start with to go off and do these other things. Um, so we, and they have the numbers reflect that much that you have that many starters on arguably your top team in your club in a flash team yeah came out of our club that's great that's that's a nice little just like we're proud of that 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 happened we don't look at it and go oh, they, it's, nobody stole any of our players nobody did anything like that and the kids can go over they want anytime they want anytime they want so that was where we just didn't have a spot for them we just didn't feel comfortable during COVID so then we started back over again little by little starting last year where hey let's pull some kids out start putting the teams together where that right. goes with that We'll see as it grows. Um, I don't think we're competing with anybody per se. We're not trying to take kids from programs. We're just giving kids the Another. opportunity for, we think, at least as good, if not better, training that you're going to find anywhere else for that age group. And at a decent decent rate, mm -hmm. um, are we going to be more than some of the town clubs? Absolutely. But we're also inside on turf two to three times a week. Exactly. That no other town teams are. They're usually on gyms or r terrible times at from nine to ten o'clock at night. Yeah, and even with that, and I don't mind if I can find. And we're working on that now. If I can get gym space, especially geographically, that works for our kids, one day a week to work on ladder work, juggling, and do futsal, that would be phenomenal. As our third day of the week, mm -hmm. that would be awesome. I just don't think putting it in two or three and you're always in a gym, that's not great either. And I don't think that's the expectation level. If you're going to do that and you have, you're competing with, not they're competing, but I'm like, you're looking at a third flash team or something like that. The kids at least on, on turf and decent facility, like you do want those things. So at least some parents do. When you first started Soccer Roos, right before COVID, mm -hmm. was it summer? Was it that summer or the winter? I think we were just about going, we were going to start, it was that spring we were going to get ready to, to, un, to we were going to do a spring and then we we couldn't because things folded. Did you? And we already, I think, started registering for summer. Did you start with one location or did you already go? <clears throat> we were going to do, we're I, gonna think, have I think, two or three I think locations. we were going to do three. There were at least two, but I think three. 
How did you was, mar- like? How did you market? Like when you went from Happy Feet to Soccer Roos, how did you market? You just go through your email list. Mm, I think we sent something out through through emails, like from the kids that we had in the program previously. Like, hey, this is what we have. Didn't really mention anything about the previous program. Just like this is this is a program that's there. Soccer Roos, okay. got it. This is available. Um, kind of like this is what we're what we're doing, mm-hmm. and um, then it's you know whether it's flyers to daycares, things of that nature. Um, putting the signs out like we invested money though in trying to market ourselves and I think we've done a decent job um, then putting some more money like this past year getting trying to get better at Instagram I don't know how much that really paid off like people check off like what they're what brought them in and for the amount most, of, of, most of it is just word of mouth most you know, word of mouth is gonna be the biggest one always by far. always by far mm-hmm. the, the second one if they get a flyer like in their daycare or in their school and that kind of thing that's gonna make a difference and some of the school districts are phenomenal helping us out with that. Some have gone green, so then it's on a thing, whatever, that most parents, like myself, I don't see that with my kids. Unless it comes home with their folder, I don't know. I, I'm not going online to look for it. Yeah. Um, so if it comes home with my folder, then, yeah, we'll take a look at it and we'll see it. So it's it's trying to figure out those kind of things. And those, those are the schools, though, that are going to benefit because they're going to have more kids down the road playing. And I think that's one of our big goals with this whole thing. It's not... We want this team so we can win this tournament or this stake up or make that this kid placed it somewhere else. It's over over the years now, it's changed to like watching high school soccer. Can we have more mid range players be better? Yeah. Like, can we get the middle to be better? Because that drop off from kids that are playing, say, at Flash or Rochester, or Western New York, FC, whatever they're called. And mm-hmm. but having those kids is the next level, this gap that is huge. And I want less kids quitting. Like I heard at the convention last year, the year before, I mean, two years ago, one of the, the things I went to, 70% of the kids that are playing in U10, which could include like eight-year-olds, 70% of those kids will quit by the age of U15. Yeah. Or 15 years old, anyway. So that's U16. That's 70%. That's a massive number. Huge. And it's not just in soccer. It happens in other sports, too. So there are a bunch of things that go into it with the kids just not getting out and playing more, but they were playing. And it's enjoying what they're doing. But within enjoying it, it can't be just this kumbaya and, and sugarcoat every like finding hopefully that balance of some competitiveness, but also success and trying to find that with the kids and trying to get them to learn. Kids do want to learn. So it's it's finding ways to do that. Hopefully if we have a bigger and that was part of the reason to try to build these teams, but some of the kids like that are in between, I tell them right away, I'm like, don't not play. Like some of the kids that just started at age seven, they're not ready to play on a mob team, but the kids do like what we're doing. We're not big enough to run rec teams and everything else to, with that, too. We did a little U10 this year, and it mixed. It wasn't exactly what I was hoping it would be. but um, And some people liked the product. They liked it. But I feel like that's where some of these town clubs are better suited for it. Like, they have their house and their travel. Mm-hmm. A lot of them have house to go to U16. Um, some clubs are better at it than other clubs. We try to push them to the ones that I feel like, from what I hear, sound better. Like, they seem to have their act together. Mm-hmm. So push those kids to there. And maybe they end, and if you really want to play travel, some of these clubs also they can play travel. So we're not trying to grow too fast, um, or be I don't know. Like I said, we're not looking at things going like who's our biggest competitor. I don't know. I don't know where. We're just trying to do what we do. That's all. Mm-hmm. And if it's if this works for you, great. If it doesn't, that's okay too. There are other products out there. If we're Apple and you prefer Microsoft, it's okay. I'm not going to sit there and tell you all day long why ours is better. Like this is what we do. People that like it. They really like it. And in terms of the soccer ruse, I mean, they're real. Is there a competitor? I mean, you got soccer shots. Soccer shots does stuff. They do stuff the way I would have done it 30 years ago, probably. Um, or like a gym, if you had a gym teacher, just nothing as a gym teacher. But if a gym class is just going to do something in soccer, like, this is the week we're, two weeks we're doing soccer. Yeah. That's what they do. And I see them hopping over cones and kicking the cones. I see less touches on the ball sometimes. Things of that nature. It's not to knock them. It's There's a market for, for that. Just like there's a market for somebody being half the price as us and the kids get maybe a lesser t-shirt or don't even get a t-shirt the first week and there's 11 to be a lot how many kids we can fit on the field. There's a market for that. Some people are okay with that. The kids are just running around and they get whatever and they get an award at the end and they go home. I'm like, we're trying to be a little bit more than that. Mm-hmm. We're trying to do a little bit more, but not everybody wants that. So again, I understand I don't take it personally. Um, and again, I don't mean to downgrade soccer or any other group out there. No. I just feel like the people that have done both programs overall usually will 
they'll see the difference. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's all. They'll, they'll see the difference if one's better or worse or whatever. They can make their own decisions from there. And we're not always perfect. I tell them all the time. We used to have, before COVID, we had more college coaches than high school coaches, and now it's the other way around. And I don't know if that's because college kids don't want to work, but I have a hard time getting college kids to work. Hard, hard time getting them to come out. Um, do you I don't have, know what that issue is. But that seems to be pervasive in every industry right now, so I don't know what the issue is. Do you ever get pushback of like, oh, well, there's only high school kids? Because I've heard somebody talking about one of the local clubs. Oh, well, it's only high school kids. I'm like, well, high school kids can be very, very good. I mean, look at Taek- look at Master Chong's Taekwondo. He has high school kids teaching Taekwondo. That's a way more technical skill than like a lot of how people approach soccer. You know what I mean? I think so. Why is it okay for Taekwondo, but like when it's soccer, people are up in arms? It's and I see two things with it. One, if you have high school kids out there with not with a lack of direction, it can run really poorly. Exactly. Very poorly. Um, and I've seen that. I'm not going to name the club, but occasionally, especially when I was younger, we'd throw them into something just so that something I'm not running. Right. But along with that, my wife would be like, is this all? I'm like, eh, whatever. I think, I think we went almost a whole session didn't have a uniform, just wear a white shirt. And kids are heading the ball <laughs> at like eight years old. And I'm like, <laughs> kids are slide tackling each other, knocking me out. I don't know. It's like, eh. And, and with a lot of high school kids out there, not much. The supervision was, was poor. Um, so young kids, you have to understand they don't have kids of their own. Um, so it's trying to teach them like an understanding of those things and like try to get them up, like especially if the weather's not great or they're there working three, four days a week and they're you can kind of tell like, hey, this is your fourth day of the week doing this. This is their soccer day. You need to be up for it. Enthusiasm is more important than anything. Enthusiasm in what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Make it a special day for these kids. And if you can do that, but it's so that's on me to make the coaches better at doing those things. Yep. Some are just going to be better at it and some aren't. And then we take hours away from people and try to get new people. Um, again, I can't do that with volunteers. Volunteers will be stuck there for the year. So, um, again, it's not perfect. The difference between college, though, college kids can implement what I'm asking them to do far faster and better right. than high school kids. It's just a maturity level difference. And that's nothing, even the most mature high school kids. It's just not the same. Their attention span, not quite the same. Mm-hmm. I might have to repeat myself two or three times. I mean, I have a teenager in my house now. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, listening skills, not always awesome. Usually not awesome. So it's it, it's just dealing with it. Whereas the college kids, like, I would be surprised if I said it once, if I had to say it a third time. Like, repeat. Like, remember, after we clean up the balls, I'm like, no, no, we know that. Like, boom, boom, this is what we do. Also, you gave us a manual of what we're doing. Like these are key points. Mm-hmm. They've got it. So it is what it is. That's just the age difference. Just like you can't expect the same thing from a five year old as an eight year old, or an eight year old and a fourteen year old. It, it's different. But there are some great high school kids that do a phenomenal job for us. Sometimes better than occasionally a college. Yeah. I've got college kids too. They just want to show up and they're just not into it. I respect one of the coaches that came in. And I think she might have been twenty years old at the time, nineteen twenty, and uh, maybe twenty. She was college age and. She was like, she watched, and this was back when we did half feet, though. She watched one of the sessions, and after she gave me the shirt back, she goes, Coach, this program's awesome, but it's not for me. And I was like, I appreciate that. Because I would have other coaches sit there through for six, eight weeks or whatever and start calling off and stuff, because they don't like it. Uh-huh. Like, just be, just be up front with me. Like, this is not for me. 100% okay. Now hmm. we're not wasting each other's time. So that's why I try to tell the people when they first come in, I go, if it's not for you, I'm okay with that. Not hurt my feelings. Really not. So, but if you're going to be here, got to be here, got to be here and into it. And then let me know in advance, not texting me 30 minutes before we start for whatever the reason is. Oh, I got to go to a wedding on today. They just throw that together. Yeah. (laughs) Thanks for the notice. Yeah. Wow. All right. Dude, an hour and a half. So, so you're going to be in, you're here playmaker on Sunday mornings. Where else are you on what day for Soccer Roos? So for Soccer Roos, um, most of them will start in January, not November. Oh. December. Last year we kind of did the same thing. How, too. how many uh, how many places for November and December? Just here? I think this year just here. Last year I think okay. we did here in one other location. Um, maybe over at Sounds. Part of that is because of my lack of ability to get into space. It's been tough. Um, 
But some of it too is our fall program is still going for one location that finishes this week, one has one more week because they had a, a rain out date. So it, even your, your, your people that are really loyal to you and want to keep it going, like a little break. Like you're not going to get as many kids to sign up mm-hmm. if there's no break in between the program. Yeah. So giving a break, and you know, as I always tell them, like, go try something else too. Like I'm 100 percent for that. That's why I put my kids in rugby. I was like, go for something else. Like, hey, what else can they do? Yeah. Do something else. Um, so that's why a little healthy break, and then in January we'll have um, we'll have one in Orchard Park, we'll have one here, we'll probably have one in Lockport. Um, Possibly one in Depew. I'm still working on that, and I've had a lot of that one's always on a wait list. As soon as we open, it fills up. Uh, Where would it be? A, that's in a Depew. new era. Oh, new era. baseball that's place, right. but that that's one right. too. It's struggling. Can we get that time again? So, if, if can we just get six or eight weeks there to put a program in and run something there? So the demand is higher than our ability to put stuff out there, but we're trying to do the best we can with it. Man, we need more facilities. We do. Love to have one somewhere central ish um that we could just do training center type of stuff have you guys come in have marcel come in have people that just do training not meant for like big games or anything right but just a training center and something though that we know we could run <laughs> some of our mob teams there a couple days a week and what's so funny is that when we first opened up this a lot of coaches sniff their nose at it like oh you know what we don't this is too small for what we want to do now they're begging me for time because nobody else has it. And we don't need 11 v 11 fields. Well, all we need is more of these, maybe a little bit bigger, but all we need is more of these. That's no, there's well, no even, reason even the why top teams most of the time over there at Salins are using a quarter of the field. Exactly. They're not using a full field. So, and some, some organizations split it up into like sixes. Yeah. And I mean, there is no reason why some of these massive town clubs, Clarence is one of them. There's no reason why they don't have their own facility. They own that land. They they own the land. I know. Just I think, just I think, take out one field and build I a think, build a I building think they on do it. An awesome job, and they do a really good job also marketing some of their products and their cups and sweatshirt. They do a great job of that stuff. I think they're doing fantastic. There has to be enough money coming in that you could invest. To do, I would think oh, you have this 100%. big nice outdoor like space. Work with the town, or something, you would think, but I don't know all the ins and outs working with the town. But I, it just feels like you're a big enough club that has your act together that you could could have done this. Yes, or could do it. Instead, you're basically begging me for nights that I don't have or hours that I don't have, and you're paying a fortune to somewhere else to Epic, where you could be just paying yourselves. You pay, and you have that write off. Of the depreciation of the building. But they just don't do it. And you don't need the size of Salins. All you need is one field. All you need is enough to fit six teams in. If you could get an indoor facility and fit six kids in there for an or six teams in there for an hour, you're set. You'd be set. You would have to have very limited space. Then that opens up epic for other organizations that are desperate for time for time that gets them out of the, out of a gym and into a turf area but yeah and i i've talked to because i with the legends guys like they gave me blueprints on how to do like you know the like the way they did at their facility mm-hmm. not that we want to necessarily do those boarded the big boarded fields but i like those the smaller ones those you know, like boxes or whatever like racquetball size yes uh, you know 12 by 20 and having a, a just a few of those handful of those where half your team could be doing 1v1s in there and you rotate them every few minutes you have certain ways you score their games in there and then the other half of your team out in an area doing whatever you want to do in that space or even playing a 4v4 out there, mm-hmm. 3v3, and then flip them and then have the other group in there for, say, 45 minutes and then here. And you score the kids and next practice, switch so everybody gets a chance to play each other. I'm re- I love that from Legends, how every kid's playing everybody and, and yeah. all these 1v1 things. So sometimes you're going to get beat. We used to do it with AFC. I'm like, sometimes you're going to get beat 8 nothing, But then two months later, that player that was beating 8-0 eight, eight is now it's a 5-5 five, five, three game I'm like you take some pride in that you lost but it's five three mm-hmm. and you get on the other kid what happened to you like you had this lead like you need to push it like you need are you letting down and like they used to they have on their their sheets and stuff like grade their effort to have the kids grade their effort not just their score what do you think your effort was at a 10 and try have the kids try to be honest about that I'm like I love those concepts and those are things that 
again, I didn't come up with that. That was all like legend stuff that just through those guys and, and reading uh, Andy Barney's book. And I'm like, I'll take stuff from anybody. Like good ideas. I was like, that is a fantastic idea. So really big on that. And I know Anson Doris does a lot of that stuff with scoring the kids and stuff yeah. like that at that level. But I think even with the young ones, it, keeping them competitive or, you know, back in the day, some of the other premier teams would do the Dutch tournaments and score. The, I love right. that kind of stuff. Um, but especially when it's 1v1s. I was like, it's not why I have this teammate I had it. It's 1v1. It's all on you. Yeah. It's all on you. And yeah, it's, you're going to match up poorly against certain kids, but you have opportunity to go against everybody. So, and then you're you're basically scoring against yourself over time. Am I improving against these these players? So, I I said I the the bottom line is can we develop better players and keep it fun? Um, and that's our goal. And keep them in and keep them keep in them the in the game. If they're having fun and they're developing, I've said it over and over again. You're not in a bad spot, and that's where people when they start to leave clubs, and I'm like, if you already had those two things, I don't even understand why you're leaving. Um, if you're missing one of those, I 100% understand why you're looking mm-hmm. at another club. And a club should understand that too. Like, where, where did we go wrong? And I try to look at that too, where, hey, am I doing something wrong or is it just, this is what we do and it just didn't, didn't fit and that's okay too. Um, or did, did we do yeah. something wrong? And I'll admit it for like, you know, we dropped the ball, man. We didn't do this as well as we should have. Yeah, that's going to happen. When people respond to that, well, if you apologize, you know what, we did that wrong. That's my fault. I don't think clubs usually people aren't leaving a club for the. We're not doing big things like that usually. Just I don't think cl- I don't think clubs do that. I don't think clubs care when they lose. Some clubs I don't think they care when they lose players, because they'll just replace them. They'll just replace it, them by yeah, with a Canadian depends, or an Erie or it depends on the yeah, club. If you're talking about some of those the premier clubs. Yeah, it's it's that dog eat dog, and they just don't care. Absolutely, like they have enough. Yeah, we'll be okay either way. And I get that it's more. If you're losing numbers of kids and they're, they're pretty good players or people that were loyal to you, I've seen that with other places. These kids were loyal and now they're, they're leaving. That's where you need to look in the mirror and go, why? Yes. What, at what point? Not just go, they. Or the, we, if we build it, we will, they will come mentality or, well, we've been here for 30 years. You know, we've always been here and we always will be here. Not necessarily. Not no, necessarily. It's, it, it's like, for example, my brother's the, the trainer at Duke University, so he, he got to be around Coach K for a long time. Yeah. Um, but even Coach K, after all that success, um, one of his interviews he was talking about it, like he changed a lot, a lot over the years um, of how, because his players changed and that kind of thing and how he treats them and how, not treats, I shouldn't say, but how certain th- things, how he does because those kids have changed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, generationally. Um or like when he was in one of his books, he talked about like when he was coaching under Bobby Knight and Bobby Knight had coached him when he was, was it Army or whatever? Okay. So we played. So I think that's, I think he was at what Army and Bobby Knight coached him. Either way, Bobby Knight coached, coached um, Coach K when he was a student athlete. And then he was an assistant under him at Indiana. I think it was at Indiana. Yeah. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> he said, when he goes, coach. How come we haven't run that drill that we used to do all the time? He's like, I have Quinn Buckner. I have this guy, this guy, this guy. He's like, we didn't have guys like that on that team that you were on. <laughs> He's like, I'm not running. He goes, those guys would be like, what are we doing? Like, I would lose, they would lose their respect because that's not what they need to work on. So it's that understanding of like, it depends on the team you have. You don't just do what you do. And no matter what the people you have, that's going to work. It's you have to change and adapt sometimes personally with the different generational differences, but also the level of players and the kind of players that you have, you change. You don't just throw out the same thing no matter what it is. Mm-hmm. And then just it's going to magically happen. And that, that stuff's brilliant. Just like he's going to treat, I'm sure, those Olympic teams differently than some of his Duke teams. Because oh, he didn't have Kobe Bryant and LeBron James. Yeah. Like, then, like, he had great players. Right. But different. He had 18, 19 year old really good players. Right. Great and players, now... actually. But all of a sudden, now you're talking about world class players. Yep. And that kind of thing, which he learned much, much earlier about that, about like, yes, you go into it with that kind of thing. And it, so it's learning from that. And I know we've talked about that before. It's learning from other sports, not being so just like like the, the soccer mentality of like, screw every sport out there. It's, this is soccer is different. Exactly. And like, you can learn. That's why I think Bill Belichick, and I know Bill's fans hate it. 
the guy is like a chameleon though with his teams when they were good one week they're running the ball like constantly another week he's opening up and throwing it and he's not the only coach who's done that too you change right. and adapt um, the old Steelers teams like their defense because they could smash the other receivers and stuff they changed the rules all of a sudden they're like well, we're going to do that too Brad has to run the ball more now yeah. so it's learning over the years like the teams that had success the coaches that consistently had success through different eras of rules and different yeah. types of teams and everything else I'm like those fascinate me those are the ones I'm always like because you can learn off of that and I think that the coaches that just want to do what they do and expect you have to change you have to be open to change and open to like looking at what works for other people. Mm -hmm. Take what you can. It doesn't mean everything's going to work, but take what you can out of it. Um, and not just scoff at it because it's whatever. That team just does this. I'm like, okay, but how are we going to beat that then? I'm like, we need to adapt and overcome. Adapt. And I tell it with the, whether it's college kids or young kids. Adapt and overcome. Yeah. Don't, no excuses about this, this, this. Occasionally at the end of the, eh, you know, we played these games above our head. That's fine or whatever. But from game to game, no. We can't control that. This is this is what we did well. This is what we didn't do well. And we have to work on it. And just keep doing that. The kids respond to that. As long as you don't blast them with it. Like you just, it's just up front. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. And commend those kids when they do it. Those kids that are might have been struggling when they have a little bit. Boom. Build them up. Build them up every chance you get with positivity. But don't just throw positivity around just to do it. Yeah. <sighs> But that's just, again, and there's a, there are multiple number of ways to have success. I never, ever say, like, my way is the best at all. Or is the only oh, way I should right. say. It's the best for me. Right. It's not, and it's the best for some kids that have played for me. But there are a whole bunch of ways to do it. Just like the whole club should every team play the exact same formation. Everything. I think not at all, at all. But, hey, certain people want to do it that way or clubs want to do that. That is 100% their right. And if they have success with it, fantastic. Right. Um, I think the more differences the kids have and the more understanding they have of different formations, different styles right. of play, the better off they're going to be because most of these kids are goals to try to play in college. Yeah. And they don't know it. And they're going to be playing in different positions. They're, they're going to be playing for different styles. They're going to be in different formations. And then these kids, well, we've played 4-3-3 since I was 11 years old. We never played another formation. It's like, how is that developing a player to adapt? Right. But what if you have a kid no. that would be great outside mid? And I'm not does saying... He have, does he or she have a spot in that system? Right. And I'm not saying like you should switch every single game based on your opponent. So eventually, you want to build something where like they have to adjust to you. Sure. But you're... So everybody just copies the Barcelona method of like, well, everybody in the club plays a 4-3-3. Yeah, they also get to recruit a 13-year-old from Argentina that is the best player ever. Like you're not you're not recruiting a the the best thirteen year old in the country, and th that drives me nuts. And then I go out and watch those teams that are so stringent and and just suffocated, and the players are suffocated, and they can't stand that style of play. The players, and it's like you don't adapt at all when you're playing against a professional team. They're you're playing against their youth academy, and you can't. You can't do anything, and it's constantly built out of the back. Five yard pass here, five yard pass there. It's like, can we punt it just once, it's, just to it, back but, them off? Yeah, off you? It's like, no, we're it's, gonna play the way we play. Exactly. It's but as long as you're telling the kids the why, we're gonna do it because they're just squeezing all this space. Yeah. That's why we're gonna do it. Exactly. Because I took over a team at one of the the premier groups. I don't want to like bash these, but so it was a girls team and good players and everything. But they were just like constantly. I'm like the other team is squeezing a space. And it took forever to, like, you played up. So then a couple times they're hitting it when the short ball was there. And I was like, take what they give you. I'm like, if they're giving you this, great. But if they're backed yeah. up and they know how far your kick is, and that's where they're lined up, then we're going to play it short and we're going to go. Yeah. I'm like, it just was a struggle. And I said, because for years they were ingrained in this is how to do it. Yeah. This is how to do it no matter what. And we scrimmaged some other teams in the club. And I'm like, we're just going to do this. Because they're predictable. You're so predictable. And I hate that. I tell players, don't, especially as they get older, I'm like, yeah. don't be so predictable. Right. Like, you're just asking for another coach to just kind of scout you a little bit and to shut you down. I'm like, and I will if I ever coach against you. I know what your weaknesses are. I know what your tendencies are. Yeah. You need to be able to switch it up a little bit. Even with a couple, some of our kids now, I'm like, we're doing a 1v1 drill. And I was like, you're always doing it just with your feet. I'm like, a couple different, like one more change of direction or yeah. fake or fake the change of direction. But yeah. I need one more. 
and you could have beaten that player by yards. I said, instead of trying to squeeze through this little space. Yep. I'm like, this this is the difference. And just keep on them and keep on them and keep on them as opposed to just throwing a drill out there, watching the kids go through it, and everybody's doing the same. Like, that's the only thing with clubs. Like, every team's looking the same. So it looks to the parents. I, I feel like GPS used to do a lot of that. Like, every field looks the same. They're all doing it. That looks great. That's fantastic. And I'm like, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. And it's not to smash all of you because there were some good coaches there too. But I'm like, you're also handcuffing your coaches sometimes. Of like, Because I was there as a coach one year, and I just do what I wanted. And nobody said a word to me. And like the same thing my one year that I was at Flash, and I remember we went out, and some of the, the coaches were like, uh, oh, they were talking about something. I said, you know, somebody, one of the higher-up people, and they were getting on their case, and I was like, ah, oh, he never says anything. They're like, yeah, I know. And you do whatever you want. Everybody's doing this, and you're off doing that. You're not playing 4 3, three. You're not doing this stuff. I was like, yeah, but they, I don't know. They just don't. And I asked, asked them, and they're like, yeah, but you're, uh, you want to go to the GPS? I, I said, we're doing this and everybody else is doing this. Like, don't the parents ask? They said, yeah, some of them have siblings on other teams. I said, well, what do you say? And like, well, they, we ask them, do you like what he's doing? I'm like, oh yeah, it's great. Like, all right, well, the customer's happy, we're gonna let it go. I'm like, okay, but how does this fit into what we're doing? I'm like, which is okay. I was just always the square peg and there's a <laughs> bunch of round holes. Yeah. And I'm like, I didn't feel like it fit in at any of those. And that's part of maybe it's just, it's up more on me. Like maybe I just belong to my own thing. but. For the most part, those clubs didn't. I, I can't say they got on my back about it. They just let me do what I did. Right. Um, I feel like they should do more of that. If you bring in some good coaches, let them do what they do. Right. Um, there was at one point like Demarsh and Eidlin and Henrik and myself. We had straight through, and there were a couple of their good coaches all on the girls' side at one club. And for whatever reason, there were different reasons. All those coaches left within about four months of each other. But it was great when we would like have little scrimmages against each other and then we'd you know stop out for a beer or whatever afterward and be talking about it and we had huge mutual respect for each other even though we came at the game from extremely different ways of looking at how things should be done mm -hmm. at every single part of it like i remember and i liked i love like demarsh and I, I think those guys are great and they'd be like because especially back then before they had kids all the kids with their stuff zipped up just so and their shoes had to be polished. And oh, yeah. Clothes. Shirts yeah. tucked in. And, and I'm like, I get it. It's the John Wooden way. I get it. It's got to be just a certain way. I get it. And there's a, I don't have enough room in my brain to worry about any of that stuff. I'll take the kid that looks scruffy and just works his butt off. I just take that kid every day. And I'm like, I don't have time for that. I'm worried about this, this, this. We, every coach has certain things they're worried about. I'm just not. And I'm like, you look like you're coming out to get the morning paper. You got a hoodie <laughs> on and you just, whatever. I'm like, they're like, Hey, how the scrimmage go? And he's like, yeah, but you're squeezing. And we just get in this back and forth. But I said, we all had mutual respect for each other because our players got better and our teams got better. M markedly better. Like every single, every team that we had, whether it was club A, B, C, D, if we had a team for two years, that team got much better. Those players got much better. Because even talking to Nick, is like, like, what? You, a couple of those kids like that used to like blah, 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 blah. And he's like, kid, no. It's like, coach DeMarsh and walked by. And I'm like, no, it's just how we do things. Like, but you get them in a mode and you build a culture and this is how we're doing it. I'd love it if we could do it more as a club, but even within that, you have to culture within your team. So whether even at the college, I'm like, hey, we're going to support every team. We're going to cheer them on. But don't let yourself get caught up in, oh, the volleyball team and they have these players and they're complaining about that. I don't care. We don't care. This mm -hmm. is us. Our level's here. In the classroom, on the field, our level is here. This is what we do. And you start building that culture after two, three years, especially at college, and all of a sudden, they're already working with a freshman on that. And like, they're fine. Oh, you don't go on social media and do that. They're doing it way before I get a chance to do anything. That coach we got this taken care of. We just want to let you know. I'm like, yeah, I saw it. You saw it? I'm like, yeah. It's like, oh, we took care of it. I'm like, I love the fact that you took care of it. You know, tell this kid. That kid has a, a nursing program, practical, whatever, on Tuesday nights. That's why she's not at practice on Tuesday. And you're over there going to send out a tweet or whatever. Like, never makes it on Tuesdays and still going to start every game. This is BS. <laughs> okay, you have no idea because you're freshman. You just showed up. It's not your fault, but that is not how we do things. We don't just complain about stuff on social media. <laughs> this is how we do it. You have a problem? Go to a captain. You don't get the answer you want? Go to an assistant coach. Go to the, go to the head coach. You still have an issue, then you can go to the athletic director. It's like if we have not appropriately addressed your concerns. Like just a certain way of doing things and a culture that's there. And... So many good things happen when you can do that. Mm -hmm. And it takes a while, though. I was talking to Averick about the other day with the Bryant Stratton men's team. It's like, 
Oh yeah. You're you're expecting like I haven't even talked about freshmen. that. Freshmen. You're talking about freshmen coming in. Yeah. In this core, I go, you got a core, it's gonna be awesome. In two years, they will have built a culture. But this is the first year. Right. So sometimes you get a little bit of that riffraff attitude and stuff. You just can't expect it to all come together in, in one season. No way. And he's done a phenomenal job recruiting that team this year. But there's not enough depth and you know, not enough of those players exactly what you want. And kind of Parcells like his players. And he, I, I think he, he's one of the most underrated coaches in this area. I, he's coached two of my kids, and my wife can't say enough good things about him. Um, and she's a harder critic than I am as far as the soccer side with the kids. Mm-hmm. She's a much tougher, tougher critic. So that and just seeing the team he recruited, I'm like, because you not just have to be good at the coaching side, you need to be good at recruiting. And he has shown them one year he's good. So I'm like, I, I was like, it's great just being an assistant helping him and then sort of try to get a women's program too. But – and that's what you're, good, you yeah. just got named that, right? You just got yes. named the women's and you're yes. starting it from scratch. From scratch. But you know what? Just like in the interview, I told him, I said, my first year at Diubo, we were out in Front Park Field, which is was over by the Peace Bridge area. We were yeah. getting kicked off that field by co-ed teams. Five, five o'clock, 5.30 rolls around, we're getting kicked off. Got to leave the field. I'm like, and there was one kid that was really a pretty good player. And she was hurt all the time. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just ankles and stuff was hurt the whole first year. And the rest of the kids tried, but they weren't college level players. And it is what it is. I'm like, they tried everything I asked and everything else, but they weren't able to play at that level. And that isn't even like top up, but it is. So then it, if it does nothing else, it is going to make you um, go out and recruit. Like it gives you incentive. Like, I don't care what my budget is. I am going to recruit and get players. And then next year in 10th place, which is last third place, lead the conference in scoring. Still had trouble allowing some goals, even though we had a great goaltender. But we were all—I had three forwards in my back line. I'm like, we were attack, attack, <laughs> attack, and you build off of that, and you build a culture. And over years, we got to be a really strong program. Um, and it's doing the same thing, though. It sounded like you had a bunch of it. You had to go out, so it's just, you're starting with zero. I'm like, if anything, you don't have to worry about that second year having players that were here before you got here that are still there. Going, what's what? I didn't get my playing time. I don't have this. I don't have that. Which we had then, Diego. We had some kids that were second-year players. They were used to just playing every minute of every game. And now, even though we win, and one of the girls that was a captain, the one that was hurt the first year, she went up to kids that she was friends with and was like, you need to adjust your attitude right now, like out by the bus. She goes, otherwise, don't come on the next trip. Don't even come back to the next practice because we just won a big game. We won a big game for this program. You need to support those players, not complain and moan about your lack of playing time. Right. And I'm like, that was tough because two good friends with those kids. And I'm like, that's a leader. And it's that's where you start to build that culture. Did you get a chance to watch the Carly Lloyd um, the Carly Lloyd podcast or whatever on it's on YouTube. It's the CBS like Galazzo channel. And it was Clint Dempsey, Charlie Davies, uh, Maurice Edu, and I oh, what's her name? Uh, the English woman that uh, does the Champions League, Kate Abdo. And Carly Lloyd is basically talking about that. And that's like what's missing in the culture of the women's national team now is like that. And Carly kind of just goes off on what's going on with the national team and the problems with youth development and the problems with like it's just the ECNL. And that's the only pathway these days and whatnot and it's really good and there's two parts i think the second part gets released today but that's excellent and that's right up that alley no and, right up that alley. and that is part of the you build a culture with kids and that was early on like that kid i kept her on as a grad assistant afterward yep. um and then i was lucky enough to have kids and i think some of it within your recruiting you don't necessarily know um what you're going to get but once you get those kids in there you start to see that development not just as a player, right? But that leadership, leadership, and the culture. The culture is le- is leaded, or led, leaded, led by the players. Yes, it starts with the coach, but it takes the buy in, and then those it's the players that lead yes, the culture. But you, need, you need a coach that's going to kind of help instill that in the first, like find those players and empower those yep. players, yep, and back those players up. And basically, they tell them, like, they're like the coaches on the, like, or, yeah, the coach on they the field. The, yeah. And off the field as well. Like, if they say the same is coming from the coaching staff. Um, some of those players, like, they also, I had a, a <laughs> when you were, when I, we were talking about with the roster, 
there was a bit of a drop off. It, it, every time there's about somewhere on the roster there's a drop off. And we had some kids graduate, a really good class. I think it was that first class that graduated. Mm -hmm. And um, we still had a bunch of really good players. But I talked to some of the kids around the team. Some, some I think it was mostly like some juniors. One of the, one of the juniors I think that was on the team at the time who was one of our better players. She was in the group that I talked to. I said, "Listen, I said for the final roster, I said we got these two or three players, returning players. I said, do we keep them or not? I said I I just don't know where they're going to get the playing time. But at the same time, our schedule this year is pretty tough. We got a bunch of SUNYAC teams that are we're going to get knocked around a little bit. If we have injuries, we could be in trouble." Mm -hmm. And one of them said, Coach, I'd rather play short than play with them. And it had nothing to do with personalities. And I was like, I love you. You are so my kind of player. Like, so my kind of player. So it's every once in a while when we get players that just say certain things, it's like, oh, you, you get it. You get 100% of what, that's, I love that. And mm -hmm. she didn't do it to impress me. That was just her. That was just how she That's felt. how she is. And I'm like, that's awesome. Because she also, she, some of the kids like certain things like, give them a video it's about like teamwork or whatever and it's got these bulls attacking a boar mm -hmm. and like <laughs> they go after like the weakest one or whatever and then they they get in and they get him down enough and the boar is fighting back whatever then they realize he's got them they back out and let him kind of bleed out of enough and then go finish him and obviously with a female team there's like some of them are like that's the worst thing i've ever seen and some of them are like it's awesome it's just awesome exactly and um but one of them said i don't like i, I didn't like i get your point but i didn't care for it was also the one that was like I'd rather play without them. So she was already on board with it. That's just like, but she got the point of it. And I remember the men's coach at the time, he was like, uh, he watched it. And he goes, are you guys the wolf or the boar? I was like, what? And he goes, the boar fought really, really hard. He goes, I, I, can't, I have to respect that you've worked out. Like, I go, yeah, you guys could be the boar all day long. We're the wolves. I was like, we are never the wolf. Even when we, we are never the boar. I'm like, that's just a mentality going out there. I was like, <laughs> no. No, 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 no. So that's, I think that's the whole, like, that and, like, do the, like, even with the younger kids, especially with the women's team, like, that big giant hammer that we have, and we give it to the player who has the best tackle each game. It's got to be a legitimate. You can't just go out and blade somebody and go, I got that. Uh, yeah. But, like, a best tackle, <laughs> and they take pictures, they put it on their Instagram. We used to do that with our, you know, with our AFC teams, and it's building a culture of that. 100%. Thing. And it's like the turnover chains and like college football. Yeah, and they and keep it. They take it back. Yeah. To, like college, they'll take it back to their dorm room. The younger kids, they keep it. They go home. They got to have responsibility and bring it back, which gives them to happen. Um, but <laughs> not right away. But and then all the kids get on. Bring it, dude. Bring a camera. Like, it's okay. Um, but like at the college team, they bring it out and like other teams see it. What the, why are they bringing a hammer out for this? Put it out by the bench. Boom. Like who's getting the hammer at the end of the game? Like. Something other than who scored the goals and that kind of thing. The kid that absolutely just, uh, Kayla on our team for a while. She was getting like oh, Kayla got. I go got to step up your game and be better. Kayla's just going to win it every single game, and it shouldn't be that. It shouldn't be that obvious. But she was just she was a hit in the midfield. Boom, just oh, she hit it. Kid at Franciscan. Like that's but that's my personality too. I'm like I like finesse and everything else, but I was like she a 50 ish type ball right over near the touchline. And she hit the ball, and this kid, the kid ended up parallel to the ground. Yeah. And as she hit the ground, you could hear the wind come out of her. And then she just kind of rolled up and rolled over. And like, I was just like, and you feel bad because I wanted, I waited for a second, and then you could see that she was okay. And I turned around, and I just, that was awesome. Like just to the bench, like oh, that was awesome. Yeah. You go, no one's topping that. That's got to be the best of the year. And, but like that's just, I just couldn't, I can't help it. And I'm like, those are the kids though that are just like when they see that, and they're just like, oh. One of my mentors was like that. I, I worked with them at Detroit Country Day. We're in the state semifinal. Uh, one of our players who ended up playing at Brown won a tackle in the first five minutes. The head coach goes, "This game's over." It wasn't. It was. It, it wasn't even five minutes in, and Tariq just came in and just cleanly killed the kid, and the head coach was like, "This is over." Ended up winning two nothing, and. They, things can it can have an impact. Such a games. tempo. It can it can have an impact. There was one and it was late, late in the game. My wife we got home. She goes, "That was totally unnecessary." And I was like, "Oh, it was so necessary," because um, it was a team that had traditionally just beaten us up. It was one of the Penn State teams, whether it was Altoona or, or Barron, and we were winning late in the game. And this punt came down and it hit the turf, and you could see their center back waiting for it. 
And here comes Cam full speed and hits the ball first and just crushed this kid. And I was like, oh. And they ended up whistling it down, but I was like, she got ball first. And like, I was like, you were up by a couple of goals and it was late. It was unnecessary. I go, it was so necessary. I go, with that rivalry that we had built up, I was like, because we were up there with those top teams now. I'm like, yeah, it was necessary. I go, no. I'm like, we're going to see him again in the playoffs. I'm like, it doesn't matter. I'm like, that's the tone. That's the level. Or um, Altuna, we, they had beaten us by a lot the one year. And then we brought this recruiting class in. We were, we were good. Um, but I got the team so prepared for that game. And it was on our home field. And we got to halftime. We are up 5 nothing at half. And one of the one of the twins came off, and she's like, "Coach, I said these guys were good. These guys suck. And I was like, they're actually pretty darn good team." I go, "You guys are just playing out of your mind. Like, you guys are playing <laughs> out of your mind." Well, I go, "They're a little off from last year. A little mm-hmm. bit. They graduated a couple of players, but I go, you guys are playing out of your minds." And immediately, I put like second half. I'm putting out other players and stuff that don't normally get time. The other team starts like trying to show us up and nagging players or whatever. And I'm like, "They're down." I'm like. I think they got a goal. That's why I wanted. It wasn't the goal so much. It was their attitude on the field. And I was like, DJ, so and so. I put a couple of players. I go, we need two more. I go, I don't want them on the bus ride home going, we won the second half or thinking that they did anything positive that's in the past. That's true. I want, and that's one of what we do match goals and team, team or, uh, season goals. But one of our match goals is score the last goal of the game. Whether we win or lose, score the last goal of the game. We end on that note. One of them obviously was try to score the first goal of the game too. But we have 10 goals and like if we had at least seven of them chances are we won the game right so but that was one of the things and i'm like i don't want them and then we did we scored a couple of goals and it wasn't about anything other than just that and i wouldn't have done it against any team but again that team and what they were doing i was like no 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 no, no." and i want them on the bus going home going we can't play with them i said so that's sending certain messages at that level i'm not doing that with the seven and eight year olds or whatever but at college level 100 percent I go, they're in our conference. This isn't some just ran. No. If we're up by seven and they're just like whatever, both teams are just letting their subs play. But I go, they got starters out there and they're like trying to show it. I don't understand. Like, what are you doing? You're down by four or five goals. Like, but that's okay. I was like, you can do whatever you want. You coach however you want. You players do. But I'm like, when we have an opportunity, that's a team we're going to do that. Um, or if just like you, everybody does. You remember certain things. Same thing in football or else. You're like, I don't remember that. So we get a penalty kick against some team. We're going to do like a fancy one where we come up and then like pass it off and have the kid dribble. Lay the off, goal. yeah. Yeah, and it was like a little salt in the wound. I go, anything like that. My kids were like that. We, we had one, I think it was Alfred or somebody. We were winning the game already, but the game got a little bit out of hand, dirty-ish, back and forth, whatever. It was uh, late in the game, and the game was pretty much done. But they came down. They, were, they had a penalty kick. Our goalie makes a save on the, cor- on the penalty kick. Ball comes out to the side. They take another one. She makes another save, immediately grabs it, throws it out to the, the player toward the touchline, who immediately carries the ball up, and we get like a 2v1. And with like as the clock is down to two seconds, we scored a goal. We could have easily just held the ball, but she comes over. She goes, salt in the wound, coach, salt in the wound. <laughs> Send them home, like knowing who's the better. T- I was just like, that was just awesome. Now, if you're up by six goals or something, you're doing that, that's like. But it was one of those games where it was still semi-close mm-hmm. and just some bitterness back and forth, some, some little – plays after the play and I was like no that's good that's good I'm like so I think it, it it's knowing that as a coach and, and teaching the players we're going to be sportsman like and everything else but there's a gamesmanship to it at times too and that's where we want that edge always the the, the psychological side always about an edge mm-hmm. always 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 I'm like I, we had a team in one stake up in the year after I coached them they went to uh, back to the hotel the year before that in Syracuse that we went to when we lost. And I was like, I'm not superstitious at all, but don't surround them with stuff that reminds them of when they lost. You don't have to go to the one when you won, but you definitely don't go back because I remember some of the players like, oh, it's all we could think of once we got there. This is the hotel we were at when we played horrible and we lost. I'm like, don't do that. Like, I don't care what you have to do for a We're gonna get it, we need a different hotel. Do not, like, no. I'm just huge on that, and it's not superstition. I'm not superstitious. It's at not all. superstition at it's, all. It's it's psychologically. It's it's short term memory loss, and it's it's next. It's that like next play mentality type thing. It is like if you take over a program where they've only known losing. The first thing I wanted was new uniforms. I want something where they're wearing something different. Everything's different, and you turn the page. This is new. 
like that first year I didn't have a chance to recruit the world whatever's there and everything else but that next year we need to change our jerseys we need our budget here we need that change this is us now that was yeah. before this is now right and e even if you take over I think a successful one it's you try to get them out of the mode of well that's not how we used to do it well this is how uh, we do yeah, it yeah you have to get rid of that and I, cause I tell players that used to complain after I've coached them with somebody else at them like you, I don't know what you should expect them to do what I did they're doing it their way and you need to buy in the sooner you buy in the more chance more success you're gonna have so you need to give them an honest effort of doing it the, the way they want before you sit and complain just because it's not what you're used to right and that's a good lesson for kids and that's why they should change coaches once in a while too is get them out of that mode of this is the only only way to do it exactly and you talk to any high-level player that you've ever been around there's seven eight nine coaches that have had an impact whether it be good or bad impact on their career it's never one person it's 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 cliche but it's, it's a, it takes a village and there's some coaches out there that hold on to teams way too long there's a reason why european clubs they change every single year you know it, it's one so that the club gets the credit and not one coach but it's also about just the different voice I mean, and the different. I think I think that's one of the biggest problems in America. Not to go on too much on a totally different topic, but just the the how come we can't do this as opposed to other countries? We're a different culture, and you don't have like we're better at basketball. Even when these other teams are getting better, we're still better. We mm -hmm. put our best players in there. We're going to be better. Yep. Because not just the middle class or upper class kids that can afford to play in the uh, whatever leagues or whatever. What is that called for the kids for basketball with the youth stuff? Sort of like their ECNL or whatever. Right. Um, AAU. AAU. Yeah. yeah. So AAU. It's the kids. If you go in and watch kids at the park playing in New York City or other cities, and they're playing, they know the names of those players. They look at that as their dream and their way out. That's what you have in a lot of these other countries. This is their way out. Mm -hmm. They also have some middle school or middle income level kids or whatever, but. You need to have a mix of like your entire culture is like they see that as their way out. They see that as their dream. There aren't as many kids. There just aren't kids doing that. In the, no. In the, like this is their dream. And what's their dream to play? Like go play in Europe? Because their dream isn't to play in the national team other than maybe Pulisic. Maybe they don't know anybody else on the team. Right. Maybe. So I'm like they just don't emulate that kind of thing. Right. And you have all these other sports and everything else competing. Like you don't, you're losing them right from the get-go. And it doesn't matter about the price of soccer or anything else because you could pick up a ball and play and those kids aren't doing that. Right. They could do that. They're not. Like, they're just not. So I get the whole idea of like, yeah, if it was all free. If it was all free, do you think all these kids in all these, these poor neighborhoods are going to start playing soccer? They're not. They're just not. There are programs out there now to try to get kids playing this stuff. They're not. It's a different culture, and that's okay. But maybe just like temper your, your dreams and expectations, and like, why are we not this? And maybe follow this system or that system. And like, how about we just do the best we can? Do the best you can with what you have, and build the best system you can. And wherever we end up is where we end up. Mm -hmm. um, and make better. And over the next, I don't know, decades and decades and decades, maybe that'll change. But probably not. Like, probably not. It just doesn't. You might get two or three guys here or there, but it, it's, it's a different thing. The women's side, we've been better because our culture was also with Title IX and we things care, like that. We cared more we about women's care sport. about women's sports and how Way much competition earlier. do they have. Basketball, that's it. Basketball, that's it. There's only one other sport to compete with. That's it. None. Where are the rest of the women athletes going to go? Just soccer. And they saw some 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 success right away, so they emulated the '99 team, and they, you get a bunch more players playing yeah. and everything else. Their field hockey's not gonna do any like where, right. where are these kids going? And that most kids that play softball, it's a diff, it's a totally different sport, different body type, right. everything else. It's not those aren't usually the athletes. And some that's, will cross over, but not not a lot. And that's why the stupidest argument is: Well, what if our greatest athletes played soccer? Well, they do on the women's side. How's that going right now? I mean, well, the, the, it, it, we had a head start. The world, the world is starting to catch up with that. Exactly, but, because they care more. But it's not better athletes necessarily. Like it's it's a it's a mix because at least you have a bigger pool of people playing. Yeah, it's a bigger pool from the start. Um,
But that's where right now you could say, well, more kids play youth soccer than almost any sport at the age of, say, six or seven. Mm -hmm. But we're losing 70% of them before the by, age of 15. By 15. Um, now, so are the other ones because we're getting so specific and premier level at such a young age. But um, kids are, yeah, and I think kids, they don't like playing sports that they're not very good at either. No. And, I think that's... And I think that a lot of times... With, if they don't make that A team, they'll quit. They'd rather quit than go and play on the B team well, sometimes. That's, and that's sort of what I've felt for years, though, is the B team. And I get it. Sometimes it can work because you have different levels all within one club. It's like, oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. But if your B team is pretty good or you got good kids there, then I almost feel like you do need, and I know you preach, like having other rival clubs for opportunities. But part of that problem is, do we have enough coaches for all these teams already that are good? Mm -hmm. I would say probably not. And I have a pretty big ego as a coach, just like a lot of coaches do. But I don't, there are a bunch of good coaches out there, but not enough for the number of players. We've gotten far better than we were, say, in the 80s. Right. Where we had some Europeans coming over, and those are the ones, if they had an accent, they probably were the best coaches. And, and now we have some you know players that have played the game, but it's, it's just like the coaches now, I don't blame them sometimes. They're coaching how they were coached. That's what they know. Yeah. Licensing and stuff can help, but if you're unless you're really trying to expand your knowledge and, and do all that stuff, which takes a lot of time. Um, and, and, and then even if you do know a lot, do you have the personality that's going to translate to coach whatever age group? Yep. Is that work? There are some guys that are super, super smart soccer guys. But they don't know how to translate that to the players. The players won't run through a brick wall for them. I'm like, I'll coach against them any time. The guy that scares me, a guy or, or, or girl that scares me as a coach, is the one that their players will run through a brick wall for them, even if their mm. overall formation or whatever pl game plan is kind of shoddy. Yep. Those kids are more dangerous because they're going to run that system, no matter how bad it is, as hard as possible. And run. That's a hard team. That's a team that's dangerous. Yep. Um, at least if they're semi comparable. And, technical ability right but either way so you're in for a harder day and like i've had teams win against them it was like that coach is brilliant the players i because some my brothers had actually played play for some of his coaches and i was like yeah i remember the brother was like uh yeah i don't even care like we're playing for it. not because of personality just like yeah yeah <laughs> hopefully to get the kids into it not to be rah 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 but just get them into it like yeah like, i don't know and that's what i'm looking as a parent I'm always looking for the one that can get that out of my kids. Yeah. Some of it is on the kid to do stuff, but if you can find a coach that can turn them on like a light switch to actually work harder, get more out of them, I'm like, Make, that's worth whatever I spent. You, right, and you want you want to have you want to help the kids develop the love of the game because if they love it, they're gonna do more of it. If they leave practice and they hate it and they hate the coach, and they hate you, and they hate the game, and they hate their teammates, and they're never going to work on their own. No, and there can be a ton of reasons for that. It could be just the coach. It could be they're burned out. Yeah. They're doing too many things. Could be parents. Um, could be a whole bunch. Uh, but, but there's a few, where, again, where I look at other coaches, and I have respect for coaches, where I'm like, everywhere that coach goes, the players and the teams get better each time. And those players are loyal. Like, they speak highly of them right. years afterward. Yeah. I'm like... That's a good coach. Even if they do it totally different than I would, I don't care. Mm -hmm. That's a good coach. Um, and that's where I feel like, yeah, I, I do the same thing. It's a very personal, like those are my kind of kids. Those are my kids. You know, so they move on and stuff. I'm like, love that kid. And there's so many of them now where I'm just like, and you could have conversations with them now and like, they'll know if they come back to help out like with an assistant or anything else, they know what kind of kids I'm looking for because they're that kind of kid. Mm -hmm. And they just see it and they can find instinctually and they go, that kid. See how that kid tackles? I'm like, yeah, the kid doesn't have a left foot. We got to work on this, but the kid tackles. I'm like, so are they coachable? Yes, then sky's the limit for this kid. So working on that, not just the fancy kid, and you go, hey, try this. And I'm like, like, they're just aloof already, and they just don't know, or they won't win balls. I had a team like that, and one of the kids, and the parents are like, I understand what you're trying to do. Not mo you're trying to motivate them by not starting them. I go, no, I'm not starting them because they can't win. They can't win a ball in the midfield, and they lose the ball like it's their job in the midfield. I go, they bumped off the ball, and they're just like, oh, I didn't know there was contact in the sport. I'm like, they can't play midfield, so they're going to come off the bench as a forward. Yeah, but they're on this, and this is back when ODP was big. They're like, such, such ODP level. I go, I agree. 
she's phenomenal. But she turns the ball over like it's her job in the midfield. <laughs> it's not her job. I go, and has she tackled once and won a ball or won a ball out of the air? I go, she never will. I go, or, not right now. She needs to start doing that. And when she does, I will love her to play on this team in that position. But you can't play midfield if you can't win a ball. Right. It was just my, I, you can't win a ball. I don't care what you can do when the ball's at your foot. Right. And when you do have it and you're getting knocked off the ball at least half the time, that's a problem too. Your fancy, boop, bounce off the ball. They got ballerina classes or something. You go do something. Or be one of those fancy people. They didn't have like TikTok back then. You do your own little video for it. I'm like, but you need to win. We need to win games and you're in the midfield. Yeah. I'm like, and that team was, by the time we got got through our, like a year with that team, that team was a different team. Just like, but I had kids in that midfield. Some kids weren't starters before. They're in the midfield just winning balls. They were yeah. ferocious. And it was like, and then can we complete pass? Do not. Yeah. Winning balls to, to a teammate. Yes. We did that. That is the, one of the biggest coaching points. If you can, if you can nail that, win the ball out of the air to a teammate, you're gonna win most games. We had it was I think I think it was it was either semifinal or the, or the final for the national championship back in 2008, and they the coach at the end of the game just like it was, we dropped players off a bit or whatever. But our midfield, and we did it one year I think at Snake Up too. We had a lead, but it was only like a one goal lead. But the other team couldn't barely get out of their end. Goal kicks up there, serving it up in punts, whoosh, headed it back down, boom. If it was just under the flank and boom, make it. I go, a ball under the flank isn't always the best ball, but it's never a bad ball. Boom, and they work back out. And we're just like, this is the line. They're not playing in our end. Ball's anything in the air, whoosh, and we just won everything. And that team was a good, it doesn't matter. I'm like, I'll take that team over almost, and I've had more talented teams, I think, talent-wise, but no team that wanted to win more than that team. No team that would change however they had to change to win the game. Oh, they're, they're in physical, we'll meet the physicality. Oh, you're technical, we'll meet the technical. Or we'll be more physical to overcome this te technical or speed or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And they could adapt. And they just had that want. But that that midfield, I always be like, the forwards are our first line of defense. But I was like, that midfield, that was the key. That was one of my teams where I was like, we win and lose with the midfield. That team is, they were so strong. Usually I'm like, if the forwards don't do their job, everything else falls apart. And that starts with being basically defenders. And I've had parents who'd be like, loose teams don't defend, we attack. Which I'm like, that's our mantra sort of, but we do, it's just that we, when we can, we press, we teach them how to press. Right. And even when we drop off though, you need to tackle backs. Backs hate to be tackled hard. They hate it. Don't you be a, a fancy forward. I'm like, you tackle. Yeah. And you get chances to double them. You do We find an outside back that doesn't belong on the field or can't play with us. Channel to that it. side, yeah, and, going at them and then all day, <laughs> all day until we see the player go off and be like, "It's awesome, that's one for us right there." And like, oh, who's this kid coming on? Who's yeah. the sheep? Who's yep. the sheep coming on? Yeah, exactly, because the sub is not as good as whoever we just replaced. Not, you unless think. you see them all of a sudden unless move a midfielder back yeah, or someone else, and I'm like, "Yeah, we've played better defense now because they've taken an offensive player back." And I'm like, "That's how we're, our first line of defense." When I went from a small like community club to Vardar in Michigan. I got to work with one of the best coaches in all of Michigan. And one of the very first things that I picked up off of him was matching up on punts and kicks. Meaning, you treat it like a corner kick. You match up. If you just mark up on corner kick or on uh, on punts and goal kicks, you're going to win so many more games. Mm -hmm. And if you just implement that into 8 to 15 years old, you're going to win a lot more games because you're winning all the loose balls. I mean, it's been great. But I think, and that's where it almost translates to like NFL football, where field position means a ton. And I don't think when they're teaching the kids just build out of the back, which it has its place. But if you're always in your own end, it wears on you. And I'm like, I think on the flip side, I was like, when they're down a goal, make them work the entire field through us. If they can work the whole field through us and score a goal, all the power to them. Let's not give them an easy. Let's not give them a short field. Uh -huh. Like use terms like that that are easy. Like just be smart. Again, yeah. get the ball as your target. You know what I'm saying? Boom, diagonal ball in space. And like our outside player might beat them to the ball. And if not, or even if it goes out, I'm like just throw in deep in their end. Yep. Let's pinch that space and win that that same kind of attitude as the punts and the like that's the ball we want to win. Now we're going thirty yards to a goal. Right. Thirty yards. And it's situational soccer. Yes. We like we don't teach situational soccer because we always teach and preach build out of the back, 
You're saying that every situation in the game is the exact same. You're saying that being up 2-0 is the exact same situation as being down 2-0. That's what we're turning soccer into is it's always this. It's always that. It's like then I'm watching college games where Niagara, Niagara just gives up a goal in thir- in 18 seconds because they drop off everybody from a from a free kick at half field. They don't mark they don't put anybody within 10 yards. They don't put any – there's a girl here. This is half field. There's a girl here wide open, and that's the box. Nobody's within 10 yards of the ball. Nobody's within 10 yards of this player. They just knock a ball out wide. They yeah. n- they lump a ball into the mixer. Boom, goal. Zero. It's 1-1 one, one tie, and now that could cause Niagara to be out. And it's like situational soccer. Kanisha's boys had the exact same thing where – one of our players, Kyle Pollard, got a red card because of a mind-numbing situation and organization on a an attacking corner kick. Their attacking corner kick led to a red card as a last defender there. And it's like just situational soccer. We don't teach it anymore because all we're working on is building out of the back building or possessions. Out, building out of the back. And that's where like some of the parents that have, have asked, like, when they, especially when they saw us over the summer playing it, some kids in our close to our own age group and we were playing well and they're like, you know, what's what is the difference? And I mm-hmm. said, you know, a lot of it is the one v ones, two v twos, a lot of technical advice. But the other thing we we'll work on is situational tactics, huge on situational tactics. Like on throw-ins, this is what we're, what we're going to do. On corners, this is what set pieces, but also just situational. Like when we're taking our goal kick, the backs, even with with here we're, and close to them, so we could have it or we can make a short pass. But when you receive it. I've seen other teams do it, and our kids will do it if you let them. They'll go up here and have their back to the, everybody else. They go, by the time you get it in turn, you're getting crushed by a player. Yeah. I said, be here, touch the ball, and you can start dribbling up, looking for your width, looking for other things here. But it's in, and it's just over, because you're young, over and over and over again doing that. And I was like, on the flip side, yeah, because so many, and it's, it's bad soccer because it happens so often, but at the same time, you're like, if the other team's going to feed us balls off of that, then we're going to take it. I'm not going to tell the kids not to, but... Start to teach them at least defensively. This is how, or when we have our goal kick, this is what we do. And if we're doing a short corner, great. When do we go long? This is it here. And then build another one. Like we start to get to the point where we're doing that so well, the teams are catching out. Okay, great. That's a good problem. Here's another option. Um, as kids get a little older, there should be three options on every free kick of we're going to have three built in. The player taking it can make their decision. And one of them is just put the ball in the net. Like if you feel like you can, put the ball in the net. But have these options a little run over the ball maybe it's a ball down line past the wall maybe it's a run over here and find the space between the wall and everybody else like take a look with there and now we can't put a player on the wall anymore but there was another one off of that so i don't know why they changed that but yeah it was weird like last summer i found out because they're like telling our player and i was like why I why did that yeah uh-huh. but whatever so it, but giving players that even at the young ages not like we're going to waste a ton of practice time on it but it is going to be addressed or how do, you're coming down getting your hips and shoulders more toward that near post to cross the ball and teaching them how to cross the ball, like get their foot and toe up, crossing the ball in, not just taking across it. Like teach them the technique within that small tactical situation. Like that's the important thing. So that when you get in those, that's the difference between winning and losing games as they get older too, mm-hmm. like you said. Those things are huge. And if it's not addressed there, when is it going to be addressed? Because I'm watching teams and players. I did one training session for a bunch of kids that are all on some of these top ECNL teams and just worked on something I thought was pretty basic. And I'm like, have you guys worked? Nope. I'm like, okay. All right. It was simple. Oh, it was 1v1 and channeling. It was just a channeling thing. And like some of the kids had worked a little bit on channeling, but not like, and like some some talk about, okay, so if we have, are we going to move force that kid to the touchdown or are we going to force them inside as a team? I don't know. There's no plan. Okay. I'm like, and that's okay. If you guys don't want to, I go, we are. We are. We're gonna, and I still, we are gonna. Do, and some kids will be like, always forced to touch line. I go, okay, but not on my team. On this team, we're gonna force everything to the middle. To cover. We're gonna, I go everything. I go because if I'm the cover player and I gotta go out wide, I go that's a pain in my ass. I don't like running for the sake of running. And you're spreading us out. Let's keep it here. And if you're channeling to your center mid, usually that's a pretty good player who can tackle. Let's channel them in. But especially in, in the other team's end, yes. We in attacking end, boom, channel them in. If anything, now you get a player at the center back. Go over, double, force the channel. Make them split us when we want to be split. And teaching those concepts, not quite at this age, but once you get to U12, U13, 100%. Force them, make them, they think they're getting that split, which is what they want, which is right where we want it to. Mm-hmm. Force them into spaces. You'd be amazed how many times we could win the ball. And we had that one AFC team, and it was 
or some of our players even now, they're like, I don't think we were as good as a lot of those teams. And I was like, you guys were good. I said, but you scored so many goals by winning the ball within 30 yards of the goal and scoring. I go, but that was by design. I said, I would rather score five goals doing that than one goal that we went 120 yards beautifully up the field because it's almost never going to happen. I'm like, we're not going to spend our time trying to do that. We are going to do this, and we're going to do it well. We're also going to possess here. We're going to move through the middle third. And it's, again, there's a whole bunch of ways to win, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to move through that middle third a little bit quicker when we can, when it makes sense. But when the other team is coming out of their end, can we kind of trap them, force balls where we want them, win them. And the moment we win it, spread. And within four or five touches, can we get it? And if not, now we'll possess still. But that moment we win it, can we turn it into a scoring chance? And teaching that kind of composure, not just cracking everything at the net and like, mm -hmm. oh, that's great. Like, okay, can we get quality chances within four touches? And if not, okay, we'll build it. Or if they have players, but a lot of times they're susceptible. Now can we get in? Like you said, like sometimes teams that like there's a shot clock and they've got to get it off. But at the moment they win the ball, if the other team's already thinking transition the other way, they're very susceptible. Can we exploit that and get in? So, and we work a lot on that. We work on, okay, boom, the moment you win it, you have, you've got the ball, that doesn't count as one of your touches. Now your team has four more touches. Can we put it in the back of the net in four touches? Whether it's you taking two more and cracking it, whether it's quick pass here, combine off of it, whether it's here and find the overlapping run and then across it, whatever it is, yep. four is enough, especially for a college level team. I'm like, can we get in and score? Because if you've waited four touches, the other team has dropped back in now. And now we better keep, keep the ball. And it, sometimes you just can't. But if you can, the killer instinct, can we get in? Just like if you come down and it's not there, don't smash a ball into the side netting or whatever. I'm like, cut it back. You're off balance. Keep possession. The longer you have the ball in there, and we've had that too, where you just possess in that team. I'm like, if you possess for a minute, that wears on a defense. Imagine having it for four minutes down there. It feels like forever. Forever. Mm -hmm. If the other team can't get the ball and you're just possessing in the offensive third, it, and the other coach starts to come undone and starts yelling at the team. A lot of times, things that don't make any sense to help out. <laughs> Someone make a tackle. Like, like they're gonna come undone. I was like, so teach that composure and that. Like, have fun with that. Have fun with that. But know when to do that. When to possess and when, when to attack. Go. When is it there? Yeah. But I'm rambling on and on and on. That's what I do. It's all right, man. This has been great. Two and a half hours. We'll do this again for sure. Especially like when it's Chiefs Lions Super Bowl. Tell me, then we can do it for Vegas because we're going. Doesn't mean I'll go to the game. Oh, but no. I'm gonna I'm gonna go down. Gotcha. Be there for the Super Bowl week. The, the second week. The regular week season games right now in Vegas are like can go up to like three grand. What do you think a Super yeah. Bowl ticket's gonna be? Oh yeah, yeah. Ten Besides, grand. That's more of a corporate event anyway. Exactly. But being there and then I think I told you, so. There's like one of the hotels down there. I think it's a three story like TV thing that they yeah. Have it's by um, the pool. swim. It's uh, what's it called? Actually, Dan Panero was just there. Huh. Swim something. But anyways, that's, yes. that's where to watch the game. So be down there and be a part of that atmosphere. 100%. But 100%. If the Lions, if the Lions go to I already told my wife. I said, Griffin and I are going. Just a heads up. Yeah. I was like, we're not booking anything yet. I'm like, I'm very cautiously optimistic. I'm not getting ahead of myself. But I was like, but just if. Let's just let my wife know. Like, hey. The only thing with me is that they got to – can they do it in the playoffs? Can they win? Can they stack up with never having success? I know. With never having success, can they go all the but way? But I like go I from like, zero to hundred. I like that so far, and it's early. Dan Campbell keeping them pretty, pretty even keel. Oh yeah. And the offensive and defensive lines being strong. I think them losing to the Seahawks is one of the best things that happened to them. Because and imagine no, if they no pressure of that. If, if they if 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 they were. I'm glad we lost. I'm glad we lost week one. The extra pressure. Is because if we, if Kadarius Tony catches one of those balls, we win that game, and six and zero, and and be the only undefeated. No, I don't care about that. Yeah, because then the media is just constantly on. Yeah, you and this stupid it's distractions. It's worse than Taylor a Swift. Tendency to just get a little too full of yourself with it. Exactly. And that's why I feel like at least the Lions seem to have not gone that route at all yet. They're self aware. Um, and. He's, the coach seems to be very much on that page. Like, I, I, I just think he's done a great job. So, um, And I always say with all that stuff, I'm like, if it seems done, done well over a certain amount, then I'm going to trust them. Just like like with the Red Sox, like they've had a lot of success in the last you know, two decades. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'll trust even like, 
sometimes they switch GMs, but overall, I trust the, the, where they're going with it. They mm-hmm. don't usually have two or three in a row they are down. There's a reason to what they're doing, and you just trust it, even though you have some seasons where you just go, pitching is just dreadful. Um, it is what it is. But I think also once you've won, once you've won the whole thing, you look at things from a different perspective that Bills fans don't have. Um, so you get more panicky easily. You get just <laughs> over the top about whether it's the referees or this or that or anything. It, it's almost like it's almost like a grieving stage where it's first it's it's freaking out about whether it's the referee or the turf or whatever. But within two or three days, it's fire the coordinator, fire the coach, uh-huh. and you go inward at your own people. Um, but then the next week they win, and now you're the greatest thing, and you're going to Super Bowl. So it's that up and down, and I get it. Um, or waiting for that shoe to drop that something bad's going to happen. Uh-huh. As a Red Sox fan, I know that. But once you've won it, you're calmer in those situations. You're just so much more calm. You realize that it's 18-week season and plus another month and a half of playoffs. Yep. Like even even last year, like the Bruins. like And that was dreadful, losing the and, But less than game seven in overtime to the team that went to the finals. Yep. But being in the top seed and having the best record in the history of the game, the expectation, and that was the thing, the expectation was so high, that's the yep. pressure cooker. And it's like, can you handle expectations? The Bills, over the last few years, proved that they can't handle those expectations. We'll see. We'll see if they ever pull it together. It is a tough go, though, for Buffalo because they have that hanging over them plus just all of it. If they were ever to make the Super Bowl, I'm like, and then you got the whole Good all those luck. questions for two weeks about being zero for four, even though none of these some of these guys weren't even alive. Exactly. So, but oh, totally. But that's why the year that if they could have won that game against the Chiefs, that's probably their best that, shot. That was the year. This they could, could be have, their year, but because like, they were still, but they were still shot. young enough and still like brash enough about it. Doesn't matter what happened with that old Bills team, but now you have a couple of these, and you just have you know you didn't win when you're supposed to. Yep. It's yeah, you're gonna have that creep in at times. Hopefully, the players can put that aside and just do what they need to do. But like I said, it's always gonna be there. Believe me, I, the Red Sox for years, for years. Oh, here we go. What what big thing is it gonna be this time? You know, Mookie Wilson hitting the ball through Buckley's legs or whatever. It's just every single time, every time. Bucky Dent, or was it Aaron Boone? Like every time with the, especially against the same team against the Yankees, every time like not being able to get through. Once you break through, changes everything. Oh yeah, changes everything. Just flip that whole dynamic with the Yankees completely. Um, but that's why David Ortiz is the greatest Red Sox ever. Just, he he changed the dynamic. He's the best. I don't want to talk about David Ortiz. He's the best. All right, I am ending this. <laughs> I am ending this at David Ortiz. God, <laughs> Jesus, Verlander just throwing whatever. Thank you. Oh, that's right. The tires. Yes. We were five, I was a tire. Five to one off that game? Stop. I'm good. Grand slam. See you, everybody.